Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 399. Yes, that's right, it's E3 2013 and I am announcing the price of the PlayStation 4. No, I, I'm kidding. I'm Peter, <laughs> everyone. Uh, <laughs> Matt's here. How, how quaint that it was 399. <laughs> that seems, you know, cute almost. Yeah, well the PS5 is 499. Uh, yeah. And who knows what the PS5 Pro is going to be later this year, but uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Prices going up. Anyway, welcome everyone. So, DC Comics Podcast. Uh, we get together. We talk about the DC books we read this week. Coming up on this week's show, we have Action Comics 1063. We got Batman and Robin issue 7, Green Lantern issue 9, Outsiders issue 5. Matt read some Planetary, what he's going to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, Wesley Dodds, the Sandman issue 6, also a Matt thing. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a Patreon book to do. I'm catching up a little bit. I've got Batman and the Outsiders issue 12 to do. So. Mm -hmm. Did, did I miss you saying Batman and Robin? Uh, yeah, I said it, yeah. Okay. Well, gotcha. it's on the list. Maybe maybe I skimmed over yeah. it when I was reading the list, but it's definitely there. So gotcha. We're good, we're good. So they were here in action in Green Lantern, and then so I just wanted to make sure, or if you had dropped it and were just being sneaky. Yeah, yeah it's not like you, you know. read that, so it wouldn't really concern you that much. No, but if, if you're going to be talking about that, then I can look up covers and, oh, and stuff. Okay. Yeah, you know? You so. Uh, so... That's what's coming up on the show, but there is also solicits, and they were nice to us. It worked mm -hmm. out that solicits were this week on the show, because, you know, depending on what day of the week the month starts on, it can vary between week two and week three. Uh, this is week two, of course, um, because next week, of course, is episode 400, and me and Matt would like to do something a little extra for episode 400. Now, we're not nailed down exactly what we're going to do, but it will mm -hmm. likely be a top ten of some kind. Uh, related to the the time period since the show started, so ranking every DC story from Rebirth till now. Whoa, I never. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I said we may do a top ten like uh, runs since the start of Rebirth. Oh no, that would like please chop off my foot. I'd rather chop off my foot than do that. <laughs> I mean, did you include one shots like in there? Because that 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 inflates that significantly a whole lot yeah and i can tell you right now i don't remember all those nope <laughs> so yes but we'll, we'll do something for episode 400 next week um so look forward to that but uh yeah there's a little bit of news we got you know mm -hmm. solicits because of other things but before we get started matt how was your week it was good uh i got caught up on on oscar movies that i'd missed because the oh, last right. presentation was was sunday so i i saw poor things which it's not a matt movie Tell you that much. That was a, that was a, what's the word I'm looking for? Not difficult, but um, definitely a, a, a watch. Mm. Um, challenging. Challenging is the word. I don't know. You're attracted to Emma Stone. That seems like a Matt movie to me. Yeah, yeah but in the way <laughs> that which stuff happens, it's not very, you know. It, <laughs> yeah, it, okay. it, it, it felt not good. Let me just say that. <laughs> I might have watched some of it through my fingers. Uh, <laughs> you know. I thought that movie was hilarious. I thought it was the one of the funniest yes. things I've seen in quite some time. Um, there were parts, but and I watched American Fiction, um, which that was up for a bunch of stuff. That was very good. I had a lot of, a lot of good uh, with with the cast and the the score. Actually, I noticed. Usually, I don't typically notice the scores, hmm. um, but this had a nice jazzy one. And then, of course, I looked and it was nominated, so that was that was nice. Um, but yeah, Jeffrey Wright, that whole cast is fantastic but he he primarily because you forget like that's also commissioner gordon and you know you just he he melds into the characters he plays and then i also oh yeah he's also in westworld and you know so him playing just this beleaguered um writing professor you know it, it's almost he's almost transformative while o always remaining himself if that makes any sense you yeah. know i uh so, yeah i've not seen that one uh, it's pretty good. One of the few Oscar big contenders that I hadn't seen, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the results were all right. I, I thought the yeah, I was happy Godzilla minus one got something because mm -hmm. no Godzilla movies ever won an Oscar before, so that's nice. Yeah, uh, I was actually really happy. Uh, like I usually don't care about best sound, but mm -hmm. Zone of Interest winning best sound actually felt quite just to me because. Yeah. The sound's a big part of that movie, and it's all about like the quiet sounds in the distance and the like, gat. Like it's a, it's a big part of it. So yeah, when you pointed out how happy you were for that, I think Connor did too. Because uh, having not seen it, uh, I was kind of disappointed that Oppenheimer didn't win because Oppenheimer about blew out my my windows with with the sound changes watching it here at home. 
you know, typically best sound goes to to loudest movie or what have you. So the fact that a movie that kind of hinges itself upon the sound design, uh, that's what won. It feels like everything's right in the world. Yeah, that, that felt right to me. I haven't, you know, I haven't really been watching movies. I still maintain that that knockoff Aladdin movie a couple of weeks ago like, ruined cinema for me for the time being. Um, so <sighs> obviously I've watched a couple things for review, but outside of that, I have not... Yeah been touching anything i've been playing video games i've still been playing philip five seven rebirth uh, that's what i've been doing that's that that's enough that's enough movies aladdin with with one d <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, uh so yeah there's a scottish cat in final fantasy i didn't know that was going to be a thing but i did not either yeah news to me all of a sudden okay. this cat shows up and starts speaking in a scottish accent so fair enough he's like i'm there yeah, so that's uh, I've played about thirty hours of that so far. So wow, yeah, yeah, it's a long one. It's our big RPG. So mm-hmm. that's mostly what I've been doing with the free time this week. Uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of TV re- to review right now. There's there's more stuff yeah. starting this coming week. So yeah, uh, busy busy that's time. Good. So hey, yeah, that's, that's been more or less more or less the week. So we'll get into it because we do have some lists to talk about. Uh, and whatnot, but we'll start off with the list formerly known as the Comicsology Tom Ten. Uh, so we'll we'll get into it. Uh, as of right now, still split by Tuesday, Wednesday. So look at Tuesday first. Matt, what's your guess for Tuesday? Um, I'm gonna go out on a on a ledge and say Action Comics. It is Action Comics. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Action Comics is the currently number one ranked book on the Kindle Comics Store uh, for this week. Uh, we also have number two is Green Lantern. Number three is Batman and Robin. Number four is Outsiders. Makes sense. It's the, the four main books yeah. that I think we, we did this week. Mm-hmm. And then you got number five is Suicide Squad Dream Team. So people some tried that, I guess. Uh, yeah. We also have number seven, Sandman, Wesley Dodds. We have number seven, Batman, Dylan Dog, issue one. Uh, number eight is Fables, 162. Number nine is Red Hood the Hill, issue two. And number 10 is a collection to just further emphasize how few books DC put mm-hmm. out this week uh, is the Batman Superman World's Finest uh, volume, whatever that'll be uh, that okay. it's on. So, yeah, uh, you know, uh, which outsold Sinister Sons and Speed Force for the record, which were new single issues this week. So de- definitely some, some lower selling books at the bottom of the list there, but... Yeah, uh, it, feel, it feels like DC are, are holding back some of the the line. They're they're kind of waiting for this event to announce some new books. Yeah. I guess I I suspect if not new ongoings, I suspect July is going to be flooded with tie-ins to Absolute Power. Uh, hopefully, they're better than Night Terrors. Let's just let's put that out there. Yeah, because it's uh, June solicits we're looking at today, so we won't know for another mm-hmm. month about all of the the the, yes. the event related tie-ins. So hey. But that is uh that is the DC day. Uh, looking at Wednesday, Matt, you got a guess for number one? Um, there's there's a couple uh, indie books that stick out. Um, there's a couple like X kind of event type things or or newer stuff. So it looks like it's a bit more challenging. So I'm going to say uh, is can can I get a lifeline and is it an independent or a Marvel? <laughs> it is a Marvel. Okay, so I won't say that one then. Then I will say Ultimate Black Panther 2. Uh, that is incorrect. Dang! All right, Fall of the House of X. That is correct. Fall of the House of X is, okay. is, is number one. Uh, number two is a non-Marvel book, though, so the one got is, close. Is it Transformers? It is Transformers issue ah, 6. See, that's, that's what I had to uh, think, because Transformers was number one a couple months back. I think mm. it was like issue two it was number one that week. So Yeah, number three is uh, Dead X-Men. Is that the thing that's going on? Uh, I guess so. Number four is Ultimate Black Panther. Number five is Avengers Twilight. Number six is Wolverine. Number seven is Immortal Thor. Number eight is Amazing Spider-Man. Again, seems low for that. I guess that's just not doing so hot right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, number nine is actually a new Tom King book. It's uh, yeah. Helen of Windthorn. Uh, mm-hmm. So, very good. So, uh, I, I ended up getting that uh, physically in a, a new Ram V book that came out last month i got the first issue of that okay nice and and there was one more indie book and, and the guy that works at the shop asked me if i was okay because yes. it's normally very heavily dc but this week the ones i get physically you know it's like action and sandman so you know yes uh 
I suspect that the artist on this Helen of Windhorn <laughs> helped you make a purchasing yes. decision. Absolutely. It's, it's you know, uh, the artist of Wonder Woman 8 themselves, Bilkus Evely. Wonder Woman issue, the name. Yeah, Wonder Woman issue 8 is like eight years old, man. <laughs> I know, I don't like it. Stop. It's so old now. Stop. <laughs> That's an old reference at this point. Uh, and number 10 is Thundercats issue 2. More specifically, Thundercats Volume 1 Issue 2, which is really weird. I don't know what they're doing with the name in there, yeah. but fair enough. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, Dark yeah. Ride was the other book that I got to, which I, I get regularly with the the Josh Williamson Independent. So it was a Ram V and Josh Williamson and a Tom King Independent. So not quite spreading my wings, but spreading my wings enough that it's yeah. concerning I mean, yeah, the, but the, real, the real question is, is why you buy a Josh Williamson book you don't need to buy. Uh, because I, I tend to like his independent stuff more. Like, uh... Mm. His um, Dark Ride's been very interesting, uh, especially as a horror fan. You can tell he's putting a lot of these little references in there, and the story is really coming into its own. Um, and, and I figure it's got to end better than Nailbiter did, uh, which I was a big fan of until that last story, because kind of, you know, the way that it is unresolved, but not in a fun way. Uh, so, you know, well, we'll see how this goes. And also Birthright was fantastic. So, okay. you know, he's... He, he's not yet led me astray when it comes to the independence. Uh, his DC work, on the other hand, uh, whew. I'll just take a word for it, because I don't think I'm that interested in bothering yeah. to try most, most of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, not a whole lot to add. A couple of non-Marvel books in the top 10 for, for Wednesday is quite good. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see... Because, you know, it'll get even less lately, they'll break in. I mean, I imagine Transformers will once DC and Marvel yeah. are mixed again. But Helen of Windhorn probably wouldn't have because DC would have bumped a few things out of that top yeah. 10. But uh, yeah. we'll see how that all shakes out come July when everything gets mixed into Wednesday. So Dark Horse being their namesake again, right? They're a dark horse in mm -hmm. the race, yes. Very good. Very good. So... Uh, before we go into slots, we do have a bit of news that's mm -hmm. kind of big, actually, uh, movie news, and that is that they announced this week that Teen Titans are getting a movie uh, from you know James Gunn's led DC Universe uh, mm -hmm. stuff. You know DC Studios. Uh, this comes from the Hollywood Reporter. It's going to be written by Anna Nugiria. Uh, if mm -hmm. I'm saying that right, uh, that is the writer who also just did the Superman Woman of Tomorrow script, which does at least inspired that they're confident about that movie if they've rehired mm -hmm. that same writer to do another movie yeah you would hope anyway that said though sometimes they hire you know a bad director to direct five movies in a row so it's not like a surefire <laughs> reason but yeah you'd hope that this is a sign of confidence so there's not a lot of other things to go on we don't know which iteration of teen titans it's going to be is it based on silver age is it based on the new teen titans is it based on like sort of the you know the the Jeff Johns era of Teen Titans. Yeah. Probably not. I'd say it's more likely to be one of the other two, but you never know. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they've dropped the legacy from the title of Superman, it means anything's kind of in play. Because if we were playing with, like, a, an older Superman, I could see them jumping to mm. a Nightwing-led Titans team, you know, where he's not, not exactly what's going on now, but he's not Robin anymore. He's working with some of the younger heroes. Yeah. It's I, about I... the legacy. But the fact that we've removed legacy from the title, it could literally be any of these Titans teams. I, I would still say that New Teen Titans, that team, that roster mm -hmm. seems the most likely, but it wouldn't surprise me if they say, no, it's the Silver Age style team or yeah. something else. And I think the other big question is, is whether it is the New Teen Titans roster or not, what age are we looking at? Are we, are we doing yeah. like a modern thing where, oh, they're, they're the Titans, but they're all in their 20s because yeah. it's easier to cast for that? Or are they genuinely going to try and do a bunch of teenagers because... Mm -hmm. You know, that's tougher, but I could see the appeal of wanting that in the rock. You know, if you look at the lineup of movies, having like the mm -hmm. your Stranger Things kind of like yeah. focused type one that might grab that type of audience. You know, I, I, I know. mean, I could definitely see a, a Stranger Things type vibe, especially with Raven, if they're going to play off the Raven story. Yeah. If they're, let's say they're doing New Teen Titans, you know. Um, I mean, if this means I get a live action Starfire, you know, and, and she looks proper, then, then I'm here for it. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um, it's worth mentioning that as of right now, we've not seen any movies from this new universe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the DC were notorious for announcing tons and tons of projects mm -hmm. over a good decade or so there. 
most of which never even came to like any type of fruition. Um, or the one I'm that- still shocked <laughs> that we got an Aquaman two. Oh, that is surprising. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Like out of all the movies that made it to two, it was Aquaman. But yeah, uh, yeah so I, I really don't know what to expect there. Obviously, I hope for the best. Uh, yeah. It seems like a property that should have a movie, but we'll see. So. Uh, I mean, honestly, the biggest thing out of that announcement to me is less the movie they've announced and the fact that they're confident mm-hmm. in that writer who did Supergirl to then yeah. do something else. It makes me think, oh, that's a good script, probably. So, do you think that after Woman of Tomorrow, you think they would try to fold Kara into Teen Titans? Uh she wouldn't be a like super out of place if they wanted to do that. I yeah. suppose. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that this is a hint that they're going to do that, but Mm-mm. if they did it, I wouldn't be mad. Especially if they're, yeah. if they're going to go with the late teens, early 20s for all the ages, mm-hmm. then yeah. she might fit in with the, the team. Okay. I mean, I, I wouldn't object to it. I mean, you know, uh, it is a different take, and I think sometimes it helps, uh, you know, when you're not just straight adapting and you're, you're playing a little bit loose, it gives you a lot more to work with. But yeah. Because they could do a thing where she sort of cameos in the movie, but she's not on the team necessarily, mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, especially if they're really trying to make this all feel interconnected. There might be a lot mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, connective tissue between them all anyway. Yeah. So, I know, we'll see. Uh, but, hey, all right, solicits. We have solicits for June. I've not looked at them yet, so this is going to be Ooh. a journey of discovery. We'll find out what's in here <laughs> together. Okay. Mm-hmm. Given that the event starting in July, I'm not expecting many surprises, but well, we'll see. Uh, first up, we have DC Pride 2024. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. They've been doing these for a few years now. Uh, Al Ewing. Al Ewing? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. Just purely because I like the idea of Al Ewing doing some DC work because mm-hmm. uh, Indestructible Hulk was very, very good. But uh, we've got Nicole Maines on there. You know, per usual, a list of creators who, who are from that community doing stories uh, as they've been doing. So uh, mm-hmm. you got that. You got Batman by Gotham by Gaslight, the Kryptonian Age issue one. So while this is new, it's not new in terms of us knowing about it because they made a big yeah. announcement about all these Elseworlds coming uh, some time ago. But this is issue one of 12. Honestly, the fact that this is one of 12 is the most surprising thing there to me. <laughs> For sure. Uh, so yeah, uh, and this is 40 pages. So this is this, yeah, this is like the size of a regular book plus the backup. Uh, well, this this gives me time now after I catch up on Planetary to catch up on Gotham by Gaslight. Uh, I mean, it's not that long. I mean, <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah. I have time, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah, I know it's just it's an interesting thing that they're doing with these Else Worlds. Mm-hmm. It does kind of point to this idea of them doing more mini series. They can sell as like a single hardcover at the end of it, yep. as opposed to ongoings. But you know. Uh, uh, and also, Andy Diggle, not not a stranger to DC. So no, no. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, they really want to promote this collection because they've put it at the top of the solicits. But we got yeah. DC versus Marvel Omnibus. Oh boy! Printing that. I've never read this for the record. I, have, I... me neither. But this is nine hundred four pages, so don't drop it on your foot. Honestly, for an omnibus, that's not that big. No, no. It's an omnibus, but it's like no. I mean, like the John's Teen Titans omnibus is fifteen hundred mm-hmm. pages. Nine hundred's like normal. Oh yeah, okay. Because I, I always think it's around a thousand, and that's a lot. Fifteen hundred, though, that's a whole other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nine hundred to a thousand is about, I'd say, average for numbers. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, but this hardcover, yeah, there's oof. Again, yeah, I don't know how you're supposed to read omnibuses. Just they're so big. On a table, you read them at a table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't lie. You don't lie in bed with an omnibus. No, no, you drop that. That's that's face. Like, that's it. <laughs> Reconstructive surgery. <laughs> That's your nose been realigned for free. Yep, yep. Uh, so there we got Superman issue fifteen. Uh, I got excited there because I saw Cedric's name, but he's only a very. But it's cover. a very. I, yeah. I did the same thing. I just saw Cedric and I looked over. I was like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure the variant covers are look fantastic. I'm, I'm sure. I'm, yeah, I'm sure yeah. it does. But uh, well. yeah, it's not not what I was hoping for. For a sec. Do you know what's so funny? Is that this this cover here of, uh, of Superman screaming and there's like green shards, which mm-hmm. I assume are meant to be kryptonite. Um, there's like these scratches on his neck, and I mm-hmm. legitimately thought when I first glanced at this that, that was actually a clock going round his head because it looked like the uh, like Roman numerals. Yeah, they, they kind of look like Roman yeah. numerals. I could see where you think that. It's not, but it just my, when I, my no. eye caught it, that's what I thought I saw. So, so you think kryptonite? I'm thinking this is more like digitizing 
Because if you're looking at his face in between, oh, it's ripping away. It looks, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it looks like Matrix code. So okay, yeah, I just I saw know. I saw green shards, but you're right. But yeah, his skin's it, peeling it away. Be, you're right. It could be both. You know, it's Brainiac. Yeah, it Who knows? Yeah, so that's that. Uh, this is the end of the uh, fall of the House of Brainiac. So this is the crossover between Action and Superman. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or maybe the Action is the finale. I, I don't know. Probably is Action. But uh, there we go. Yeah. Zatanna bringing down the House issue one. This was announced, obviously, uh, in the recent weeks. This is issue one of five. Zatanna black label book written by Mariko Tamaki. Sign me up. I like Tamaki. Yes. Yep, I so. like Zatanna. But, you know, yeah, yeah. two great teas that go great together. Oh, well, would you look at that? Gotham by Gaslight issue one facsimile edition to go with the it's new like, Elseworld coming out. It's, it's like they know what they're doing. Yeah. Is there an issue two? I thought it was just like a one shot. I don't know. I thought it was a series, but maybe they did it's a, a couple of them. I mean, the paperback is really tiny. So if, if there is yeah. a second issue, it's only like two or maybe three at yeah. most. It's not, it's not a thick book at all. Yeah. Uh, we got DC versus Marvel, the uh, Amalgam Age omnibus. <laughs> Yo, 11-year-old me thought this was the coolest thing ever. Uh, me, now, not so much. Yeah, this is where like, they mixed all the... Yeah. Like, so there's Bat Wolverine, or whatever he's called. Yes. Same as Dark Claw. Yeah, as the Dark Claw. You've got uh, Storm mixed uh -huh. with Wonder Woman, Captain America mixed with Superman, which honestly mm -hmm. is the most obvious like, combo they could have done out of the, the whole bunch. Yeah, Super Soldier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, hey, there you go. Uh, we have DC Pride, a celebration of Rachel Pollock, issue one. Oh, that's cool. Uh, what's that? This is a 96-page one-shot. Mm -hmm. So they're not a Pride uh, one-shot. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you got DC Pride Uncovered, issue one. Man, these books must be selling if they keep putting them out. These Uncovered? Oh, uh, yeah. Because like... uh, Uncovered, I mean, they're just collections of covers, right? That's yeah, all they are. Yeah. But they must be selling because this is like the third or fourth that I've seen. Because I know you get, you get uh, Harley, you get Ivy, now you're getting this one. I think know. the fact that they're doing like three or four Pride specials tells mm -hmm. me one of two things. Either there's people in the company who really want to promote that stuff, uh -huh. or the, the the queer community is showing up and buying them when they do yeah. them. And that's why they're, they're expanding upon it versus previous years. Yeah. Uh, either's good. The latter's mm -hmm. probably slightly better of the two, or maybe both are true. Yeah. It could equally be both. But... Yeah, one one feeds into the other. Like yeah. as long as there's as long as there's interest, they'll have people working on them. You so, know? Uh, very neat. And th there are four weeks in that month, so theoretically they could roll out. You know, you know uh, something yeah. each week. Yeah, I think they've got what three in total. So yeah, they can spread mm -hmm. those out quite happily. Uh, yeah. We got Harley Quinn issue forty one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice cover. I like that. It looks, you know, it's it's all it's. I mean, it doesn't look necessarily quite like it, but it's definitely viewing mm -hmm. towards the animated series in terms of yeah. Uh, design. Yeah, uh, we got Poison Ivy twenty three. We have still not the last issue, so let's keep going. <laughs> we got Suicide Squad Dream Team issue four, so that's uh going still. Mm -hmm. We got Outsiders issue eight. Is Ooh. that? What's was I'm seeing? Looks, yeah, I'm seeing like a, a Jonah Hex thing, but with a woman, which would make you think Jenny Hex. Jenny but, Hex, yeah. But Jenny Hex doesn't have like a like a face, you know, like a the, the Jonah Hex face. No, but what they could be doing is like a legacy thing, right? To where they're they're showing Jonah Hex and then his progeny down the line, Jenny Hex. Yeah, she looks older than uh, Jenny Hex. But it though. is guest starring Jenny. Uh huh. Like. Yeah, I would almost, if it wasn't for the fact that Jenny Hex exists, I would guess that's like Kate's face that's been mixed with Jonah yeah. Hex for like, you know, mm -hmm. whatever thematic reason they'd be doing that for, but yeah, I don't know. But it, yeah. it does say guest starring Young Justice is Jenny Hex, so... Yeah, I mean, it probably is just her then, but mm -hmm. uh, the arts just make her look a bit older than I feel like she's supposed to be. Dang. But yeah. I am excited for this. I Jonah Hex is something that has a massive blind spot, so when when those characters show up, I get excited. Hmm. Uh, we got Batman 148. Uh, we're still cashing in those chips because it's Zarsky. Uh, this is Dark Prison's finale, so we'll see uh, how that wraps up. Well, oh, Batman 149, we're getting two Batmans. Oh no. Yep. I oh, know this is Dark Prison's epilogue. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I guess they're basically just doing like a. It's almost like it was just an annual, but it's just the next number mm -hmm. <laughs> for. for 
<laughs> for for Jin. So fair enough, I guess. Uh, we got Detective Comics 1086 with you know a nice cover, a creepy cover with all these bats with like, but it's like teeth. Yeah, like um, smiles. Yeah. There's it's a Joker Batman smiles. I do not like it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm curious to see what Ram V does with Joker in his run, given that yeah. he's been largely yeah. absent up until now. We have Nightwing 115, obviously the next part of Falling Grayson, the final mm-hmm. arc in Taylor's Nightwing, so uh, that's confirmed now, so be, be exciting to see where that goes. Uh, we got Batman and Robin issue 10. We have Batman the Brave and the Bold issue 14, which has got stories by Tim Seeley, Mark Russell, and Joshua Hale... Oh, Bialkov. Bialkov. Yeah, it's a name I haven't heard in forever. That's cool. I was like, I recognize that name. What, what, what's uh... uh? Fialkov was pretty big in the New Fifty Two, um, doing like independent, and they, I think he did a couple, couple smaller bat books. I okay, think. fair enough. But yeah, I remember you know back around the New Fifty Two era, it was a big, he was a big big name, um. But yeah, this is uh. Yeah, the cover, kind of... the cover for this one seems to have Booster Gold being. Chased by a triceratops. <laughs> yeah, sign me up. Uh, oh, well, it looks like the Jurassic League coming through, because that also looks like Super Sore mm. above, and that looks like the the triceratops Wonder Woman. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't even notice that. I just it saw is. A triceratops. Yeah. It says Nightwing and Deadman continue their rail riding odyssey and find themselves face to face with terrifying new foe. Booster Gold's adventures across time and space have delivered him to an alternate future inhabited by dinosaurs, but this alternate reality needs protectors. And it has them in the form of the all new, all different Jurassic League, and then in the finale of the Poison Within. Okay, so yeah, um, that that has to be Mark Russell, right? That, you know, Booster Gold dinosaurs. You know, mm-hmm. seems seems like they're. I might have to might have to get that for this one off. Uh, Catwoman sixty six still Tinny Howard. Uh, it's the end of the arc. Uh, nine mm-hmm. lives, but uh, no indication of you know. The, I imagine that means she's still going to be on the book afterwards. Yes. Uh, we got Birds of Prey issue 10. Uh, guest artist to be announced. Interesting. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> it's so. a great Romero cover, though, of Barda looking like destroying like a car or something in like a suburban neighborhood. Uh, I mean, you say destroy, it's more just standing on the rubble of something. <laughs> We're standing on the rubble. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to, trying to see, but. Great, great Romero cover. So yeah, it seems like it's a guest artist, but it's like it doesn't seem to be like a part of the arc. This seems to be like a yeah. sort of, you know, not a felon issue, but like a mm-hmm. you know a, a, an interlude. I'll call like it. a special, yeah, a specialty yeah. type thing. Uh, we got the Penguin issue eleven. Uh, nice cover there with Penguin sort of standing in the rain, surrounded by other people with umbrellas, but he's mm-hmm. not holding some- up the umbrella. It looks like something is burning behind him. In Maybe. the distance, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we got Red Hood the Hell issue five. <laughs> That's a book. Sure. Uh, we got Batman Superman World's Finest 28 with a zany looking cover. I'll say that. So yeah, like a like a fifth dimensional Joker. I don't don't like that. Yes, with purple squidlies is for hair. Yeah. yeah. Not that super into that, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, we got My Adventures with Superman issue one oh. by Josie Campbell and Pablo M. Collar on the art. What is this? So it's a, it's an adaptation of the cartoon that was on Max, which I did not realize that Josie Campbell was the head writer of. Uh, really? Until this, I did, yeah, I until know this. So I've been meaning to watch the show. I know Connor has enjoyed it. Um, I just, you know, I've been putting it off. Now knowing that Josie Campbell worked on it, it makes me want to check it out even more. Yeah. Um, so this is not adapting. This is actually picking up mm-hmm. after the events of season mm-hmm. one. So it's a continuation, presumably bridging maybe between season one and two if they're getting a season two. That's cool. It's like when they did the Harley Quinn show comic. Mm. So yeah. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. So, uh, Wonder Woman issue 10. And we've got a gorgeous cover here with all the Wonder Girls with Wonder Woman. And then in the background, what appears to be the face of Cheetah watching on. My my lady. Mm. Barbara Ann. Yeah. Oh, that uh, cover. That that is a that is a phone lock screen if I've ever seen one. Uh, it's pretty gorgeous. Uh, uh yeah, Sam Pierre with Ortigo in the backup, like we've been having mm, on the regular mm-hmm. issues. So uh very interesting, very interesting. Uh we have Action Comics 1000 
66. Uh, this is the House part of five. Brainiac Part 5. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, we'll see how that is. Uh, Green Lantern Issue 12, which looks like we've got Carol on the cover in our hey. Star Sapphire get up. Especially after some of the things that were uh, revealed in this issue, I am very curious to see where this goes. Yeah, keep, keep it to yourself. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, very cool, very nice cover. Uh, we got Power Girl issue ten. Uh, hope you like uh, Lobo's daughter because <laughs> she's in yeah, this. Yeah, that's okay. Crush, that's her name. Crush, that's the one. Uh, Sinister Sons issue five is a thing. Uh, <laughs> oh God, I get it. We got Neil before Zod issue six. I do kind of like that cover actually. Of Neil yeah. before Zod. Uh, it's like That's... a giant eyeball and the reflection of Zod in the eyeball. Like, look, I know I had a hard time getting into that first issue, but if I know the Emerald Eye of Ekron is, is going to factor in, maybe I'll, yeah, I'll have to get caught up by this point. <laughs> You're such a nerd, man. I am, <laughs> if I know the, the Emerald, Emerald Eye of Ekron's Ekron. involved, I have to get into it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those things that was just, it was very weird during 52 and then into, into Wade's uh, Legion type stuff. And it's just one of these things that, you know, I'm very interested in. Now, I say a lot of things. Depending when this week comes out, I'm probably not going to read it. Uh, that's fair, yeah. Uh, you got mm-hmm. The Flash issue 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spurrier's run continues. Uh, Ramon Perez on the art, though. So uh, yeah. not the usual artist on that one. Uh, we got Titans issue 12. So That's yeah. a curious cover. Everything's yeah. at kind of weird angles, but it looks like there's Trigon eyes on everybody. So uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I forgot Lucas Meyer was taking over the art on uh, yep. Titans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was the, that was the last month in this list. He's the, I followed him on Twitter, and he's the one that I got the the news broken from about the Titan show. Oh, because okay. uh, he put up a celebratory, you know, poster style art. You know, uh, mm-hmm. so seems like he really enjoys those characters. So I'm so happy he's doing the book. Yeah, you mean movie, because the show already happened. <laughs> That's what I meant, the yeah. show, the movie, yes. Uh, Green Arrow issue 13. Uh, I mean, this this is for you, Matt. I, I'm, yeah, I'm it is. taking the uh, part of it. Asian of Amanda Waller, look what I get to look forward to. What have I done? We got Green Lantern War Journal issue 10. Uh, also a pretty interesting looking cover. Uh, mm-hmm. So, interesting to see how all these Green Lantern things are coming together, uh, based on what we've read mm-hmm. this week. Uh, Blue Beetle issue 10. You got that. You got Shazam mm-hmm. issue 12. Uh, very nice. That's it's a, a that, it's a very, uh, you know, more is like, you know, hard edge jaw on uh, mm-hmm. on Shazam there on the cover. Yeah. Very good. Uh, we got Just Society <clears throat> of America issue 11, allegedly. Uh, Me. Coming. <laughs> uh, in June. Not, not a lot of uh, description there. It's a very short sentence, but... Uh... Yeah, once, well, more of my thoughts of the JSA when we get to Sandman this week. Mm, interesting. Uh, Batman 89 Echoes issue 4. It looks like Batman uh, Beyond in that universe, mm-hmm. judging by the cover. Mm-hmm. We got The Boy Wonder issue 2. We got John Constantine Hellblazer Dead in America issue 6. We got the strange case of Harleen and Harley. Oh, so it's a YA. It's a young adult uh, book. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember this. Uh, mm-hmm. Primer issue four, Batman and Robin and Howard issue four, mm-hmm. the Batman and Scooby-Doo Mysteries issue six, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? 128, Mad Magazine issue one facsimile. Even Mad Magazine is getting facsimile editions. Yeah. Uh, we got Crisis on Infinite Earths issue three facsimile edition. And then we got Batman... And Robin and Howard's Summer Breakdown, which is a full graphic novel. So, very good. Uh, and I forget the collections, which I've got here. I'll just run through these quickly. Batman and Robin, Volume 1, Father and Son, Softcover. Blue Beetle, Volume 1, Scarabore. Okay. Uh, Green Lantern, War Journal, Volume 1, Contagion, Softcover. Fire and Ice, Welcome to Smallville, Softcover. Poison Ivy, Volume 3, Morning mm-hmm. Sickness. So, mm-hmm. Nice little pun there. Uh, that is uh, hardcover and soft. We've never said that before, have they? In the no, that's a new no. thing. Because normally yeah, they do the hardcover first, and then months and months later they'll do the soft cover. But this just says yeah. available in both. 
Interesting. I, yeah. There's a, a $7 difference in between them, so... Which makes sense. You expect yeah. the hardcover, it costs more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, having them out on the same day, that's a little bit weird. I guess people the choice. Uh, same with yeah. Detective. Uh, Detective Volume 3. Is it possible they already did the hardcover solicitations ages ago, and they're just including yeah. them with the yeah, softcover? Yeah, maybe. That makes sense. That maybe, does make sense. Yeah, maybe that's what they're doing here. Maybe they're just including the previous hardcover version with the... Uh, the soft cover announcement. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, Detective uh, Volume 3, Gotham Nocturne Act 2, uh, obviously Ram V's run, Superman Lost soft cover, uh, Batman Wayne Family Adventures Volume 5, Nightwing Year 1 20th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's the Chuck Dixon stuff. Very good. Uh, yeah, and then we got 100, 100 Bullets Brother Lono Deluxe Edition. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Robin Tim Drake Compendium 1. So this is Chuck Dixon and Co.'s run on Robin uh, in a big, ridiculously sized soft cover. I like an omnibus. A soft cover that's the size of an omnibus, at less so because the spine just gets creased to hell. Yeah. But, yeah, it's a thousand plus pages. So, what's that? Uh, Absolute Transmet Transmetropolitan Volume 1, in, uh, which is a reprint because it's happened before, but this is the new edition. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 500 plus pages. Batman by Paul Denny Omnibus, new edition. So that's a reprint. Uh, so that's very interesting. This is his detective run and Streets of Gotham. Mm -hmm. uh, so very nice. Uh, and then we got Batman vs. Robin soft cover. We got Batman Detective Volume 1 uh, soft cover? No, yeah. okay. Well, if they're just announcing the soft cover from Volume 1 and Volume then, 2, which is next, then pres yeah. presumably this whole hardcover and soft cover at the same time thing is a new thing. This is so weird. Yeah. So the soft covers for Volume 1 and 2 are here in Solicis, as is the soft th cover for Volume 3 along with the hardcover. So that's interesting. Uh, we got Batman Superman World's Finest Volume 3 Elementary, soft cover. Mm -hmm. uh, Detective Comics 1000, the deluxe edition, new edition. Okay, fair enough. Yep. Uh, Poison Ivy Volume 2, soft cover. Just, just a soft cover, yeah. yeah. Nightwing Volume 5, Time of the Titans. Mm -hmm. uh, this has got both soft cover and hard cover in the solicits. Uh, Swamp Thing by Nancy A. Collins Omnibus, new edition. I didn't realize this already had an edition. Uh, but this is Swamp Thing 110 to 139, some annuals and other little tie-ins. Yeah. So this is, uh, is that before Alan Moore or after Alan Moore? Probably after. I'm not not sure, because it says Swamp Thing 110 to 139. I can't remember for the life of me what numbers Alan Moore's run was, but I assume, yeah. I'm going to assume this is after, but I'm only guessing. Yeah. So, okay. There you go. That's the last that wraps I've written up. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of interesting things there in the collections, but... Uh, that'll do it. Alright, let's get on to the comics then. Action Comics 1063, Jason Aaron writing with John Timms on the art. And this wraps up the Jason Aaron arc. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, Matt, when I started this, I thought there'd only been one issue of Jason Aaron, and I was surprised <laughs> it was the ending. I'm yeah. thankful it's over, though, because I didn't like yeah. it, but... Yeah, there was three. So this is the part three of three. Um... Yeah, I'm happy too it's over. And that pains me as a person that not only loves Superman, but loves Jason Aaron. Um, by the time we got to the end of the story, I, I like what he had to say. This could have been done in an annual size story. We did not need three of it. We did not need to go to some of the certain lengths uh, of, of the bizarro justification stuff. Because, um, again, I, I like what Jason Aaron was trying to say. I just don't like that it took three issues to get there. And, you know, uh, kind of what it seeds for later, that's something that could just easily be forgotten, you know? Uh, so it doesn't feel like, not that every story has to matter, but in the grand scheme of things, it just feels like something that can just be, you know, uh, justified right away down the line. And that kind of sucks. I mean, I, I just, like, this third issue of this story is Superman in his own brain, which is just the world, right? It's just like mm -hmm. a fake version of the world inside his head because he's memorized it all. 
And it's just him effectively trying to find the sh- shred of Bizarro, <laughs> which is inside himself, trying to take over, and then ultimately him trying to fight Bizarro. And through all of this, in the real world, mm-hmm. Bizarro Joker is coaching him. And I, first of all, the whole Joker thing just felt kind of... I forgot that happened, and then I remembered the last issue. That's who he ended up going to seek out. Yeah, it, it just kind of felt tacked on to me. I'm like... Yeah. Did, did that really affect that? If, if the whole point of this story was to build up to a point where Superman was fighting Bizarro inside of himself to like mm-hmm. gain control or keep control of himself, yeah. If that was the whole point, then I feel like, like you said, it could have just been an annual. I we we did so much build up to get to this point, and mm-hmm. I felt like the fact that at the end of the story, when Superman wakes up, oh the 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 spell, the magic spell that turned everyone back to normal mm-hmm. also erased all of their memories that it ever happened. Yeah. I'm like, then did we have to even turn everyone into a bizarro in the first no. place? I feel like we could have just skipped that part. This this could have been one of those all time kind of Superman <clears throat> stories of Superman fighting against Bizarro, but not necessarily Bizarro himself. But it's almost like that piece of Superman's mind where he's constantly doubting himself. And that piece could have taken the form of Bizarro. So when he's doing the fight in his mind, it's it's him fighting himself. And I still like what Aaron has to say about that, where, you know, the more the more you put the um, emphasis on that voice, the bigger it, it feels. So as he's fighting Bizarro, right, at first it's this very tiny version. Right. But each time he goes back and the more effort that Superman puts into fighting Bizarro, the bigger he gets. Right. And it's like this thing to where, like, the more you try, like, I'll use my anxiety uh, on this. The more I try to push back against it, the harder it pushes back. And so finally, in order to, to get around it, like I remember my therapist telling me, you have to make friends with your anxiety. Right. And, you know, the more you stop trying to fight it, the more the easier it is to come down from it. So I appreciate that's what the kind of vibe Aaron's going with this whole bizarro, right? At the end, Superman dies, like, what did he say? 88 times, 89 times, you know? Um, But it's basically, it's almost like an opposite thing where he's not just going to fight him in an open field, you know? He has to come up with a different solution to take out bizarro. And so, you know, I appreciated all that, but like you said, all of the... Turning everybody into Bizarro and having to go see the Joker and all of that, it just seemed like a hat on a hat. Yeah, I also think that a lot of the fighting in this just felt like fluff. Like, there was no mm-hmm. real stakes to it because it was just them fighting in his head. Um, it's a story which completely puts Superman on his own. Like, he's not got anyone to interact with other than this weird version of Joker, which, you know, I don't particularly like that either. But, you know, he's not got Lois to talk to, he's not got Jimmy to talk to, he's not got other heroes to talk to. It feels like he's completely isolated in this story, which is kind of the point, because it's a battle inside his own head. But mm-hmm. I think, I just kind of felt, even before I, I, I saw where it was going, that almost, funnily enough, what I didn't like about Emperor Joker, which I compared this to that last time, because it's Joker yeah. and Superman, is that was a very isolated thing where Joker or where Superman's in this alternate world where Joker's in charge. So it's kind of cut off from all of his connections that he normally has. Yeah, sure, mm-hmm. every so often he'll say, Oh, I need to win this so I can get back to Lois. But there's no like concrete like connections for him in mm-hmm. the story itself. And I, I find that kind of I don't know, unsatisfying with Superman. Like, mm-hmm. I think Superman is much, much better when he's got good supporting characters around yeah. him to kind of anchor him it's... into like why he's doing what he's doing, you know? Right, it's a constant reminder that he's doing this for Metropolis. Like, you can you can have Batman, even though Batman does everything he does for Gotham and the idea of no one ending up like him, though, it makes sense when Batman's working alone. But with Superman, the whole thing that he stands for hope and, and truth and justice is that he can be surrounded by people that kind of, that not necessarily encourage him, but as kind of like, he's a man of the people that way. So when he has Jimmy and when he has Lois or he has the Daily Planet crew or Bibbo for, you know, it, it just makes more sense. And so when you remove it all from here and it's just Joker, it's it's very weird. And I, I did say, I did laugh at, you know, when when Joker realizes that when Superman, you know, undoes the spell, he'll disappear. And we got the, the sentence, you know, Superman's pal, the Joker. I thought that was kind of funny because it was very subversive. Um, but ultimately it doesn't mean anything. 
I think it's... I think the idea of in a completely bizarro world that the Joker's the one person you could go to for help because he mm -hmm. flips from being completely psychotic to being intelligent insane. and insane and all the yeah. rest of it. There is something to that idea, but I think the way it was mm -hmm. just sort of like jumped to as a cliffhanger last issue yep. and then this joker that we get here i also think it's really weird to do this story with superman like i get mm -hmm. i get that obviously it's a bizarro story but mm -hmm. i feel like there'd be a lot more dramatic weight to batman having to work with a bizarro joker than superman because yeah. superman and joker don't have much of a connection really no so and when they do it's all elseworlds kind of stuff yeah you know? it's always separate or it's all you mm -hmm. know it's like oh we're in you know the the injustice universe where joker killed yeah. you know lois and yeah. whatnot but yeah, yeah, it's all a bit weird. Uh, Superman basically gets defeated by Bizarro, but that's kind of part of Superman's plan, because mm -hmm. if everything has to be the opposite, then that means that once Bizarro's taken over, then he becomes the opposite, which is Superman, mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Yeah, so again, I like a lot of where in it, and like, if this was just an annual, and we didn't have, like, people turning into Bizarros across the world and all of that stuff just to be undone because it's magic... You know, you like you're always want to say you can deal with magic, but there needs to be firm rules. Yeah. You know, and here we're oh well, Bizarro's spell gets undone because Superman untangles it in his mind. Uh, that's not quite the rules, <laughs> you know. So yeah, um, the, the only thing meaningful really is that there's still this fragment of Bizarro inside mm -hmm. of him at the end that he's going to have to live with, which. I can see what he's trying to say with that, as you know, like you say, mm -hmm. living with anxiety or living with mm -hmm. something like inner demon. It's, it's, but... Yeah, it's like his doubt, right? It's like Superman's like, maybe I'm not good enough. And that's what Bizarro represents, right? It's the opposite. It's the time that Superman doesn't make the save. And I, I like that, that he looks into the reflection and he sees Bizarro, because it's going to be his memory. And so, again, this was a weird one because it was a shorter read, because like you said, all of the... All the action sequences are like fluff, but I ultimately I like where it ends up, you know. Um, I, I don't so, know. Yeah. I, I'm conflicted. I, I think literally making his inner demon bizarro just feels a little bit on the nose to me. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that Superman has doubts is fine, but the idea of trying to personify it into like a it's, it's, it's a little too zero and R. If I'm honest, like it it's true, but we get this good visual at the end, right, where it's the literal backward Superman. Right, it is. It is the reflection looking back at him, and I, as personally, I think that's a, a art-wise, it's a powerful image. You know, I mean, if we end up getting that Zuranar type thing where Bizarro can pop up every time that Superman doubts himself, I mean, I, I don't, I don't like think he will much. because this is the end you of know? Aaron's storytelling yeah. here. Like, I, I, I don't think anyone else well, is going to pick this up necessarily. But yeah, I, and that's what I mean about like not just the people in in Metropolis and the world forgetting it happens, but like, yeah, this can easily just be like, you know, not never touched upon again. And when they reintroduce Bizarro, when they eventually will, you know. I just don't think the execution here has made me like this very much, especially <laughs> since it just feels a bit too like easy as symbolism goes mm -hmm. like he yeah. looks into the mirror and sees bizarro i don't know i'm like i'm not giving you an award for that <laughs> like, yeah no i don't think you should give him an yeah. award i just i do like that image though of when uh, on the last page where he looks in into it and, and bizarro's yelling back at him you know and it is uh, it is the imperfect version of superman which is what bizarro is supposed to be um but yeah uh, and also Joker graffitiing the the Daily Planet. You know, he'd rather be crazy in Gotham than sane in Metropolis. It's just like, I mean, a little bit more on the nose, just like Joker disappearing into the night would have been a lot more, you know, fine. But I feel like Aaron goes for cutesy a little bit too much here. Yeah, I'm just not impressed. I think that's yeah. ultimately what it comes down to, mm -hmm. is that I, 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 I think a lot of these big story beats that are in these three issues feel like they don't need to be here for what the main point of the story is. And even the main point of the story, I think... It almost feels like he was told that he can have this three-issue like arc on Action Comics, and maybe that's mm -hmm. all he wanted, but it's almost like, well, I'm not going to use any of my good Superman ideas for a three-issue <laughs> arc, because one yeah. day I might do a run on Superman or Action Comics. Yeah. So this is just a little nothing story that I can just kind of throw out there. Yeah. It, it just it feels it may be part of this is the format of this whole superstars thing where each writer only gets like three issues to do something yeah but 
there's great stories in comic book past that have had great hardcovers mm-hmm. because they're so good that are self-contained things that are only three issues or four issues or whatever. But yeah. I think that it, it tends to lean towards just fluffy, forgettable stories. And to me, this is a forgettable story. I will not remember a goddamn thing yeah. about this, I don't well, think. I had a hard time remembering how the last one ended. Yeah. Right? And so that doesn't mean, that doesn't bode well for the story as a whole. You know, and that bums me out as a Jason Aaron guy and a Superman guy, because this is really his first, you know, swing at Superman. And it's, you know, in baseball terms, you know, there's a pop fly to center. Like, between Zarsky on Batman and Jason Aaron on Superman, there's there's definitely a trend here of these ex-Marvel writers underwhelming with these DC characters. True. But at least the Darcy came hot out the gate with the night, you know. And, And that said, we are enjoying Offworld with Batman, so maybe and maybe you're right that Aaron's holding his best Superman stuff for another time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the night, the night was good. I, I don't know if I'd say coming out hot. I, I think it was... You know, I'm, I'm not I think give it, that it, made much us, it made us more hopeful for his main Batman title. Sure, you know? sure, but we, now, now that it's the, the high point of what he's done at DC, it feels yeah. worse. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I I went into his Batman hoping the night was like the weakest of the eight have. <laughs> yeah, you know that said, I, I think his high point might actually be that um, Red Hood story that he did in uh, Urban Legends. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that not was bad. Yeah, I like that too. So, mm. but yeah, so hopefully there's bigger things for Aaron, you know, coming. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I feel like there's ideas in here that I do like. I just don't like that. It felt like he padded them out over three issues to fit in with this, you know, mm-hmm. superstars thing. So, um, again, yeah, that, a, an annual of this subject matter, I think it's a lot easier to swallow. Yeah, this could have literally have been one annual where he just gets injected with a Brainiac thing, or not Brainiac, sorry, Bizarro mm-hmm. thing Bizarro. at the start of the mm-hmm. issue. He goes unconscious, he has to fight it inside himself, you've got Lois talking mm-hmm. to him on the outside, and he yep. wins the fight by the end of the issue. Done, right? Mm-hmm. But all, all of this stuff... With Bizarro going to that magical world to steal the yep. magic so he could do the thing he wanted to do. All of it just kind of feels like, eh, yeah, we didn't need any of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, well. Uh, what do you give an Action Comics 1063? I think this is a 6.5. Yeah, I go 5.5. I'm, I am very lukewarm mm-hmm. on it. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't enjoyed it that much. All right, Batman and Robin issue seven, legacy number seventy-three. Joshua Williamson writing with Simone DeMio on the art. So I'm reading this one. It's uh, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, honestly, this is always a quick read. So even if I don't love everything in it, uh, it it's a, it's an easy enough time. Uh, mm-hmm. It's hardly at the top of my list though in terms of what I'm excited to read. That said, though, Flatline did show up at the end of last issue, so it's, it was nice to sort of see maybe what was coming from that. Yeah, this is the first part of Cult of Man Bat, and it focuses on, well, not focuses, but it sort of furthers a little bit of, like, Man Bat being this cult leader, and Shush is kind of starting to get frustrated because this is not what she was signing up for. She was wanting his help with something, and now he's, like, got a cult. Um, I will say, I don't like this personification of Man Bat. I like different versions of Man Bat. I like the monster mm-hmm. who just flies in the you know the night sky of Gotham, right, doing a monster mm-hmm. movie thing. I like that. Yeah. I like Intelligent Man Bat from your Justice League Dark kind of yep. early rebirth era. Um, I like your Jekyll and Hyde style of, of Man Bat. Yeah, Kirk versus Man Bat, yeah. right, where he's trying not to turn. Uh, but this cult <laughs> leader who's like, he stole our image, so we're taking it back. We're taking back the image of the I... bat is a bit weird. I don't know. Yeah, that doesn't strike me as a Kirk Langstrom thing, right? As a man of science, you know, getting into a cult in, like, I don't know, like... And it is Kirk, right? It's supposed to be Langstrom? Yeah, yeah, I think it is, anyway. Because I, 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 could, I could see, like, somebody coming across the Mandat Serum, you know, no, and no, there was those nothing's ninjas. Nothing suggested to me that it isn't him. <clears throat> right. Uh, so I, I would assume it is. Uh, so yeah, it starts off with him making this big speech, uh, and Shush is a little bit upset by it. Uh, but uh, most of the issue though is Damien and Flatline. Flatline kind of says hey to Batman, and Batman's like, I know who you are, all gruff like. Even though he was smiling at the end of the last issue when he realised that Damien's girlfriend showed up. Um, 
And she kind of explains a little bit that she's in Gotham because her sister, it turns out, who she's not very close with, but her sister ended up uh, becoming kind of like, or she thinks she's actually in trouble with organized crime, but later on we find out she's actually just part of organized crime in Gotham. She's like a gangster now. Uh, but it does some backstory stuff where she explains um, that she was kind of a, you know, she was good at martial arts as a kid and, you know, went to go train with Lord Deathman, all that stuff. Um, and Damien's like, I'll help you. And she hugs him. And it's all relatively sweet. But Batman's like, hey, Flatline, I know you're good at killing, but no killing in my city. It was okay on Lazarus Island where everyone could come back, but no killing. You got it? And she's like, okay, okay. Uh, so he smirks. There is a good line here where he's like, hey, son, I'm not one to lecture anyone on diving into the night with a, a dangerous criminal. <laughs> Obviously <laughs> referencing Catwoman. But uh, he does smirk as Damien jumps off uh, the roof with her. But um, yeah, they go looking. Um, Damien also kind of recaps for her what he's been doing with Bruce, which did, like, it's a fun enough page with all these, like, Polaroids and it shows you, like, Bruce and Damien playing video games or fixing up the car or getting dropped off at school. But it does feel a bit weird because, like, if you've been reading this book, then all of this is stuff that we've all been reading. Like, we don't, we don't need a recap on this. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. that's the point, is that it's issue seven and we're at the start of a new arc. They're, they're thinking maybe some people are picking this up, they're jumping in with issue seven because it is part one of an arc. But, I mean, I don't know how many people are jumping into issue seven of this if they hadn't Yeah, been. Like, I feel not like, being familiar. I feel like if you're... Obviously, I get it for, like, long-running books. Like, if you've got Legacy Numbering, you're up to, like, 482. Obviously, no one's going to go back to issue one and catch up from issue one, right? Unless it's, like, a huge project that they want to do for the, for the, to say they've done it. But for a book that's only on issue seven, that it is very easy to go back and read one trade or just buy the singles or read them on DC Infinite as being the most easy option, it mm -hmm. feels strange to think you need a recap of the, the general premise of the book up until this point, but either way, uh, does that. So yeah, they, they get, they're, they're, they're flirting a little bit, uh, and smirking at each other, the usual thing. Uh, there is a weird moment where Flatline apparently is being spoken to in her head by whether or not it's the real ghost or just like a something in her head. I'm assuming it's real though, because of Lazarus juice or something. Uh, yeah. But like, Ghost Razal Ghoul is in her head, and he's like, "Tell my grandson the truth about why you wanted to see him." Time is running out, and she's like, "Shut up, old man." And Damien hears that and is like, "What was that?" He's like, oh, "Nothing, nothing, nothing." Uh, let's let's go on with this. So, she's not being completely honest about why she's there. Uh, so there's some connection to Raz. Honestly, a bit weird. He is all tinted green, which is why I'm thinking some Lazarus Island stuff is like sort of stuck with her, like she's come become bonded to him or something like that. Yeah, uh, he looks like classic Raz though for the most part. He doesn't look. You remember we saw him in Robin, and he had that kind of like kippy kind of look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beach. yeah. He's the dude version of Raz. Yeah, he, he looks yeah. more classical Raz uh, in her head. Huh. Uh, but yeah, they go to the Iceberg Lounge, they sort of break in, uh, the artist here, DeMeo, likes these two-page layouts where he's got a lot of yeah. angled panels and stuff. Uh, it's not bad, but it, it does kind of sometimes feel a little bit messier comp like, compared to other artists who do like these fancy layouts, where I can f f follow the, the flow of it really easily. I do sometimes find that DeMeo, uh, it can be a little... <clears throat> You know, I mean, this particular one I'm looking at is not that bad, but there's always at least a few in every issue, and sometimes they're a little bit of an assault on the eye, a lot, in terms of like just the the layout where I don't quite naturally just jump to where I'm supposed to be looking in the way that I do with other artists. Uh, not a bad artist by any means, though. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, they, they, so they find the sister and she like threatens Flatline with a knife. Uh, it's a whole thing. Uh, meanwhile, Batman's interrogating a member of the the the, the Man Bat cult, uh, who, you know, takes a pill, which seemingly, like he he basically yeah he does the whole like you know the I don't want to be interrogated so I'm going to take the cyanide pill, kind of thing. Yes, uh, the 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 old Nazi treatment. Yeah. 
I, I thought he was going to turn into a man bat. I thought that's what the pill mm-hmm. was. I thought it was like man bat serum or something. But yeah. then it seems like he just dies at the end. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, and then Shush shows up out of nowhere, and the cliffhanger for the issue is that uh, yeah, man bat, you know, lied to me, and now we seem to have a common problem. So why don't we work together, Batman? And that's your cliffhanger. So. Shush is going to work with Batman as Damien's working with Flatline to deal with her sister. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Like, I, I, I like the Flatline and Damien dynamic. Uh, everything else in this issue, though, doesn't quite have the same momentum to it as, like, when they were investigating, like, the, the kid who turned out to be uh, Zazie's son, but then but turned out really. to not actually be Zazie's son. He's just obsessed yeah. with him. Uh, you know, that stuff was a bit more fun and pulpy. Mm-hmm. This is, 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 you know, like, I don't really care about Shush, I don't really care about the Man Bat call, so, and that being, like, half the issue did def- definitely bog it down. And I've got no idea what's going on with this Ra's al Ghul, like, in her head nonsense, <sighs> which kind of yeah. tainted the Flatline stuff a little bit as well, so, yeah, I, this is probably, like, a 6.5 well, for me. Say, she can commune with the dead, right? That's part of her, her gimmick? Yes. Yes, yeah, I think so, so anyway. I'd have to go back know, and check so, her powers exactly, but yeah. I just don't know why Roz would be talking to her when, you know, I don't know. But it is definitely weird, and to appear as classic Roz on top of it all, too. So hopefully there's more. that I, I'm actually, out of all the things you brought up, that's the thing I'm more curious about, but I'm also a Roz guy, so uh, I hear that name and I want to know more. Yeah, because she could she just talk to like anyone who's died, or does she have to be like, be like near them or something? Was it not like I a- think... I think so, but he 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 died on the Lazarus Island, right? Mm-hmm. No, he was shot because that was the death of Ra's al Ghul. I don't think that, she that was, was around. Yeah, that was before Robin. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, because remember he he appeared to Robin on the on the shores. Yes. So that that was that was after the the first arc in Robin. So when he got shot, that, that led to the whole Deathstroke stuff. Wasn't all the Deathstroke stuff where he got shot before the Robin book entirely? Uh-uh, I don't no? think so. Oh, well, you're probably right. I'm just misremembering. Yeah, it came because, yeah, because cause the first Ark and Robin was the whole Mortal Kombat tournament, and then it was revealed that Raz's mom was the, the Lazarus lady, her her full name, um, that was running the tournament. And then it was all that stuff was revealed. And then when they come out after the tournament, that's where Raz gets killed. And that's where we had Talia teaming up with, with Bruce and all that other stuff. Okay. So she wasn't there though. So I think she does in order to talk to them, she has to have a tie. Um, anyways, I'm very curious about the raw stuff with her because it is a, that that is something that Williamson has been working on for a minute. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 6.5. I mean, they are, you know, from DeMeo is very stylized. It's definitely a lot of skill <clears> and talent <throat> going into it. But I do sometimes find that it all just kind of meshes together in my eyeballs. And, like, you know, like, sometimes it's like, oh, I have to actually look and see, okay, where bodies are ending to make sense of, like, some stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, 6.5 overall, I think. So, not not super enthusiastic about this particular issue. I mean, it was a quick read, though. These always are a quick, easy read. I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. All right, Green Lantern, issue 9, legacy number 545, uh, written by Jeremy Adams, art by Zermanico, uh, is back on this one. So, obviously there's a lot of build-up in the mm-hmm. early part of the issue of, of uh, you know, Hal's getting into this sort of like big hole in the earth, and he finds this secret garden, and his old friend Tom, uh, the, mm-hmm. the plane mechanic, is there. Tom Kalamaku, that is a name that I have forgotten about as as a character in Green Lantern. Yes, yeah, been a while since Rebirth. Since no, not not Rebirth itself, but Green Lantern Rebirth. Yeah, yeah, two thousand sixish or five. Yeah, Rebirth. So seeing seeing Adams pull that deep, I was like, okay, all right, we're, we're dealing with a real one here. Yeah. So here's here's the thing. I mean, all this builds up to a big revelation, right? Which mm-hmm. is that he's there to show Hal something. He was there to protect something in this Earth, and all the trees move out the way to reveal a green power battery. And Hal realizes that the energy that he's been using and the reason why he can't travel anywhere with it is because he's basically just been getting energy from this via proximity. He doesn't have a real ring. So Tom suggests, let's get a real ring. So there's like, there's there's, um, six or seven rings purely for the 
Earth, you know, for the 2814 Lanterns. And mm-hmm. apparently, the whole thing here is that the Guardians put a, a backup power battery on Earth because humans are so stubborn and too full of will that they're the most likely to survive if everything goes wrong. <laughs> so, this backup power battery's on Earth, and there's rings for, for Jess, for Simon, for Kyle, for Guy. Um, I don't know if Joe counts, because Joe already had kind of a weird different ring, plus she's like yep. the seventh one, so that would make mm-hmm. sense. Um, so I'm like, okay, this is interesting. This explains the power he's he's been using, uh, mm-hmm. and now he's got a real ring again, which he charges, so we get the whole charge up couple of pages <sighs> where he says the, the mantra. Well, very good. Uh, great pages by Zermanico. Mm-hmm. And he finally flies off. Uh, he leaves space. He looks down back at the Earth. Again, very nice pages. I appreciated in these few pages how he, uh, Zermanico plays with these like sort of like cop circle layouts. Like there's like these yeah, panels they're, they're, that are part of a ring. Arcs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the way that he plots them, they make you know, they make kind of they kind of like a, a lantern ring in and of itself, right? Uh, kind of. Well, I think it was also going for this idea that they always kind of complement what the main big image is. So in yeah. the first one, it's the Earth, so they kind of fit into that circle. Mm-hmm. And the second one, as Green Lantern's flying off, there's like a blast yeah. that's also a circle. So those panels up the top yeah. kind of like sort of like uh, just sort of fit the shape, I suppose, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's, uh, it's all very nice. Uh, but he's stopped on his way out though, because of course the United Planets have a blockade. They have a blockade for anyone mm-hmm. trying to leave Sector 2814. So all these lanterns are there, these ones that can turn into different spectrums, uh, mm-hmm. and Hal has to fight them for a bit, and he struggles a little bit, you know, he's putting up a bit of a fight, but he's struggling, and the cliffhanger of the issue is that uh, an ally shows up, a green tank shows up, and out from <laughs> the green tank pops Joe, and she asks if he needs some help, and that's the, the cliffhanger of the main story. So... <laughs> Yeah, I saw a rush through that a little bit because ultimately it comes down to to two main things. There's a power battery on Earth, and that's where Hal's been pulling energy from, Mm -hmm. and now he's got a proper ring. And secondly, now he's back in space, and Joe Mullen is part of an offense of trying to take down this corrupt United Planet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, but she's part of this resistance that are trying to take down this new wave of lanterns being led by the mm-hmm. the corruption in the United Planets. Uh, yep. So, and that ties into the backup as well, which we'll get to in a minute. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, feelings, thoughts. Where, where, where are you feeling with this? So this this it always feels there's something off with with this this arc, right? With Hal and his ring and not being able to leave Earth, and like, was it a mental thing? Um, so I, I applaud Adams for for taking the pre-established Lantern mythos, kind of tossing it out to reestablish kind of his own with this whole idea that now, you know, it, it's still playing within the lane that the, you know, that a guardian, presumably Ganthet, right? We, we'd have to guess, appeared Probably. to Tom, yeah. right? And basically told him, like, you're, you're important in this because... He's somebody that Hal will listen to, right? So he kind of gets him to to keep guard over this over this power battery, knowing that that someone in the United Planets is working on something, right? And so this whole idea of the the Guardians, or at least Ganthet, putting a green power battery on Earth because humans are so stubborn. It's a great source for that will. Um, I love it. Uh, and especially when we got the flashback with uh, the fall of the yellow battery, right? When the United Planets had went there and uh, and that one had fallen, it makes it seem like someone is going out of their way to destroy all of that other stuff. You know, so the fact that the Guardians are kind of onto this a little bit beforehand or maybe during, you know, shows like not all is lost. That not all the, you know, the United Planets isn't completely taken over. Um and yeah, uh, I, I just love this whole idea. And and the art really takes over when Zermanico, when, um, when Hal leaves the planet. And just Hal has this big, goofy smile on his face. You know, and it's like he's he's back to where he needs to be for the first time in forever. And that, between the, the storytelling and the art, it is like a near-perfect moment. 
Yeah, I, th I think there's some debate as to how long this power battery's been here. I got the impression okay. it's been here since before the United Planets existed. I think this is something that they... Okay. Was, I think it's here as a contingency and has been here for some time. That was the impression I got. But, okay. I mean, we'll see how true that is, maybe. Yeah. If, if they even go into that down the line, they might. Uh, yeah, I, I like this quite a bit. I think I really appreciate that we took a full arc or so of Hal just doing human stuff on Earth and dealing mm -hmm. with where he is mentally before we dared to go back into space. And I think what's so nice is that it feels like it does somewhat tie in slightly to what's going on in uh, War Journal. And uh -huh. I think they're using the backups really smart here, because not only is the backup, which we're about to talk about here, mm -hmm. about Jessica, which is really fun, but the whole story that, that is written here by Sam Humphreys in the backup ties in directly to this greater Green Lantern story that's going on, mm -hmm. which... Yeah, we've got Hal and John having the two main books, but we're using these backups to kind of dip into these other characters around the, mm -hmm. the Green Lantern the world. O the other 2814 Lanterns, right? Yeah. So we got Kyle last time. Now we have, have Jess. And we've got Guy you know, next time. We're getting Guy, about. you know? So, and so, yeah. Yeah, what they're doing here with Jess is that she's basically in trouble because it looks like she sabotaged the mission. And we find out the mission, and this answers one of the questions, is that mm -hmm. uh, Tharos here instructed Jess and this other lantern to destroy the orange power battery. That mm -hmm. was their mission. But Jess kind of stopped it. She contained mm -hmm. the explosion with her powers. And she makes up an excuse for it, but they're basically trying her as a traitor. They're saying, you did this intentionally. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening here, and I'm convinced this is Baz, by the way. Yeah. So... A green lantern from up above tries to assassinate uh, uh, Tharon. Theros. Right, or Theros, sorry. And yep. Jess saves him, right? And all, all I could think was, that looked like Baz with some extra, you know, shielding to sort of disguise who he he's, is. He's wearing like a, looks like a Dr. Fate helmet, kind of. Almost, kind of deal. yeah. But, it's, but I was like, this feels like a plan. And sure enough, mm -hmm. it turns out to be a plan. This was to have Jess gain Theros' trust. Because now Theros thinks, oh, she saved my life. Mm -hmm. I think we can trust her. And the book ends with uh, Jess calling Joe and saying, hey, Joe, mm -hmm. he bought it. I'm in. So we get this idea that not only is Joe fighting this war against Tharos' corrupt lanterns, now Jess is a double agent trying to get close to him. She's on the inside. And I like what they set up with her, too. Is like She's like, you know, I was a different kind of lantern, right? A lot of the rings had found them because they were overcoming fear. And with me, I was living with it. You know, and it kind of gets into her backstory a little bit, how she saw her friends murdered and she became a shut in. And then it, it gets to the point where she had become a yellow lantern for a minute because she could really feel the fear. And then it I love that Humphreys had come back to this character because we we mostly enjoyed his Green Lanterns book when Rebirth started. Um, and so to get yeah. Jess back and and to establish this is why she has a, a Green Lantern ring is she can overcome fear. And she's, you know, a big part in this plan now to essentially play a double agent, which is something that she's kind of used to doing, right? Uh, as as someone that yeah had uh, had to overcome fear and then was with the Yellow Core and all the other things that she's done, she's perfectly suited for this. And it just it makes again it's showing why each of the Earth Lanterns are distinct, uh, and that 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 is a real you know when you have all of them from the same place. It seems like overkill, but they're all serving their purpose in the galaxy. I mean, obviously, the the, the real reason is because we're on Earth, and that's why there's so many yeah. Earth planets. But yes. yeah, they're they're trying to justify it in the in the context of the, the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say, I did find the art a bit awkwardly flat at places in the mm -hmm. backup. I think Jesse's yeah. face at times looks a bit awkwardly cartoony in a way that I don't think looks that good. But yeah. uh, overall, though, I I think this is one of the most impressive use of a backup uh, that I've mm -hmm. seen in quite some time. I, not just this one, but the Kyle one, this one, and seemingly the guy one, where they're all feeding in to this ongoing thing in the background of the Green Lantern mythos as we're mm -hmm. getting the main Hal and John stories, I think is quite cool. Um, it really kind of, you know... Just it feels like it's building this larger narrative on top of what it's doing. I, I guess in a weird way you could say it's kind of like the post credit scenes of like the Marvel movies, where a little bit, but but with a bit more depth because there's more to yeah. it. Like it feels like it's revealing a lot more each time because that, yeah. that's felt like a big deal. Her calling Joe and saying, "Hey, I'm in." Like and yeah, and to be fair to the writing, 
I got, like, as soon as what I think is Baz took that shot with his cannon, I'm like, this mm-hmm. feels like a plan. This feels like a setup just to gain his yep. trust. And sure yeah. enough, at the end, that's what it Cause, is. Yeah, because he was coming down on her for, for not, you know, she had contained the orange energy and he kind of comes after her. He's like, I've, I've dealt with the orange energy. That's not something you want getting everywhere. You know, so, you know, he was coming down on her. And then when this happens and she gets in the good graces, you know, he instantly, you know, forgets that he was just yelling at her. It, so it also speaks to his character that way. Um, and yeah, man, uh, when when the United Planets had taken over the Green Lantern Corps, I was like, oh, this is, I, I don't like this. But being able that both Lantern books are be able to are taking that concept, something that I don't I didn't really like. And they're making like a really great story out of it. Um, that that's storytelling. I mean, I had no real feelings one way or the other, I don't think, about that concept. Like, I think the concept is fine. It just it just takes them to tell a story about, you know, mm-hmm. w- 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 what is the story around it? And clearly these two books right now are building a story around it, and they seem like they've got a direction. There seems to be mm-hmm. a goal in mind for what they're building to with this Green Lantern stuff. And I like the idea that there's corruption within the galaxy and these forces and, like, the... You know, the people that are supposed to be keeping the rules. And it's nice that it's not the Guardians being corrupted again, right? It's a different force. You yeah, know, yeah. Because well, they've, they, they've given us this, like, and not even just them in general, they've given mm-hmm. us one specific who is, like, the mm-hmm. the corrupt, like, president, and the one who's, like, yeah. doing all this shady stuff for his own good. Like, mm-hmm. it's very easy to kind of, like, build a villain around that. And I think yeah. uh, it's, it's given us a central figure for them to focus on, which I think sometimes can be missing. When it's just yeah. oh, in general, the guardians are up to something or mm-hmm. or whatever. So, yeah, no, this was a very interesting turn. I think this Green Lantern issue. Yeah, uh, it kind of yeah, it, it kind of opened it back up into the greater Green Lantern mythos, but in a way that yeah. seems quite interesting because it's more about this like fight to like take Green Lantern as a as a thing back from mm-hmm. this evil entity. So yeah, well, and this also like we we have the shifting lanterns right that we've seen that can adapt the different, you know, like they, we even see here that they seem like they're red lanterns, but they're making full constructs and whatever. And I'm wondering if that's as part of Theros's plan. It's like, if you destroy the power batteries, all of that energy is just out in the universe for everybody to use. Right. And so I'm wondering if that's yeah. his overall plan. It's almost like creating this chaos. So then he can climb up out of it and be the one that wields all, all of it. Uh, not thinking that Ganthet was gonna, you I, I, know. I, I don't even know if that is what the goal of the plan is. I think this could just be uh, how he's what he's doing to try and achieve whatever he's trying to achieve. Whether that's ultimate power, whether that's. Uh, I just yeah, I just it's very weird that he went after the yellow battery and the orange battery. We've heard about the the red and the blue have both fallen. Well, I, right? I think I think that's just removing more competition, though, right? It's it's removing these other groups, these other Latin cores. I. I think w- uh, part of what makes this story actually quite intriguing to me is that it almost feels like Hal and the rest of the 2814 Lanterns, they're mm-hmm. not just fighting for the Green Lanterns. At this point, they're basically fighting the for, the, for the justice of all of the different cores who have had their, yeah. their batteries destroyed. Like, yeah. they're kind of fighting for Larflees, who's been, the mention here, he's been arrested. Mm-hmm. He's been taken yeah. captive by uh, the United Planets. So in a yeah. weird way, we're kind of rooting for them to save all of the Lanterns. It's, yeah. you know, it makes me feel like a big deal. No, it does. And that's what I mean about that is like, yeah, you can look at it as a competition, but it's also if he holds all of that power, you know, and, and you have all these different like it, it's oh, almost no, like he, he's, he definitely he's, wants power. I'm just not sure he oh. literally wants to wield the, the lantern power for himself, if that makes sense. No, yeah, I don't think he wants it for himself, but he's definitely he's took in a symbol. Right. And then that's the spectrum, let's say. And he's he's weaponizing it himself. Right, because what would be the point of the color shifting lanterns at, at a certain point if you you know well, if you already have the green lanterns under? Well, the, the point is, is it's his own personal army. Like that, that, that that's what he, yeah. he strikes me as. He strikes me as a military leader or a, like a president or something like that mm-hmm. who is building a force that no one else has the power to fight. Uh, right, and that's what those shifting lanterns are. These, these are the mm-hmm. like, hey, you're the elite that I'm given this special ability to that. You know, do my bidding yeah. and you'll be taken care of, kind of thing. Um, yeah. I'll be very surprised and perhaps even disappointed if he ever gets into like a big fight himself, wielding tons of 
<laughs> lantern energy. I mean, it might work yeah. in the context if, if that's what they're actually building. I to, mean, but... as the fact that he's a Durlin and a shapeshifter too, right? Like, let's not forget about that. Um, mm. and, and all that, but yeah, no, it's just a very, I'm very curious to see if, you know, we see Larflees in, in whatever, and, and Sinestro again, if we, we get all of these different colored lanterns, you know, back, back in these pages, you know, after we haven't had them in what seems like forever, you yeah. know, just the, the mere mention of Larflees, right? And we've, the first arc was, was about Sinestro, you know, trying to recover his, his energy. All yeah, do, stuff, do so. we get some sort of all-star team later where mm-hmm. you've got Atrocitus, Sinestro, Larflees, mm-hmm. uh, and pick, you know, some of the other ones? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you, had, you had Indigo, right? You had, had um, uh, Brother, what was his name? The Blue Lantern. St. Walker, right? And all, and all those Saint guys, Walker, right? St. Walker, yes, I never forget. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then you have the Indigo. We haven't seen any of the Indigo stuff in a minute, and that's curious because without their energy, those, those people are... are maniacs out there right uh because that was the whole gimmick of, of well, the indigo core i wonder that may play into though what, what if yeah. Tharis doesn't go after that one power battery because mm-hmm. you know what we're better off with them still being those lanterns yeah yeah you know they, they kind, of, of, kind of stay to themselves alternatively it will show how how evil he is if he doesn't care if he's like no oh, destroy right. it and let all these you know murderers and whatnot right. go and, that's wild. What and that's what i'm talking about the chaos in, in it you know chaos is a ladder and he's going to use it to climb to the top. Uh, and then so we, from Solicits, we see uh, maybe Carol in the Star Sapphire. So we also have the Xamarons out there. Uh, and they don't go down without a fight. Uh, so I'm very curious to see where everything goes. But yeah, um, Adam's taking time out to establish how important the the Green Lanterns from Earth are. That they're they're essentially, you know, being trusted uh, to, to harness this, this energy here. Um, I just, I like it. And it's someone I, I feel like he's writing, not just from a fan's perspective, but like he really gets the whole mythos of of the Green Lanterns in a way that I haven't really enjoyed. I guess Humphreys did, right? But like, it, it was a little bit different. Um, and then I feel like uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson's doing his kind of own story over there with, uh, with um, John. So the fact that he's accessing all of this other stuff and we're getting these, you know, like Larflees just being mentioned, uh, I, I, I really like that. Yeah, no, I like this issue quite a bit. I think it's painting a bigger picture for where the story's going. And thankfully, I think that story's mostly pretty exciting uh, mm-hmm. as of right now. It's definitely the most of an interest in a larger scale Green Lantern story in quite some time. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, what are you rating Green Lantern, Matt? Um, I'm giving this a nine. I'm going to go eight point five. It's really, really good. I, I'm just maybe knocking it down because I think the art in the backups a little weaker. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest too. I, I did like that art there, and and you might be right. I was just happy to be reading Jess again because it's been forever. Oh, I'm. Oh, yeah, I was definitely happy. With Jess so my... I, I got, I got in there. I was like, oh my god, this is great. Yeah, she's my favorite oh. Lantern, so I was definitely mm-hmm. happy to be reading her again. But. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's where I'm feeling. Uh, mm-hmm. But notably, the other books I've rated so far were a 5.5 and a 6.5, so mm-hmm. uh, quite the leap uh, for me there. Yeah, for sure. All right. Outsiders, issue 5, Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing writing Robert Carey on the art. Uh, so this has been a very surprising book mm-hmm. thus far, and I think the last couple issues were especially quite good. Uh, that whole century child thing last issue was a great yep. little like standalone story i mean it feeds into a larger thing as well but it, it was a great standalone issue um i wasn't as into this one as i have been most of the other issues yep um so i've been reading planetary and we'll talk about it after this i'm sure sure yeah this, this is just a planetary issue and and the fact that we're calling this outsiders is very funny um because it does feel like they're they are outside of of that whereas planetary the whole point is they are these kind of they go across different dimensions and they're these archaeologists that are taking note of all these weird things and what, what it does is it takes tropes here i feel like what colin uh, uh what is it colin kelly and jackson lansing mm-hmm. uh, so kelly and lansing what they're doing is they're doing the planetary but instead of telling like these big stories of uh, of comics and pulp and stuff 
they're just using it for DC. You know, so these are just putting, you know, this is just planetary, but through this, just through the DC spectrum. And so reading through this issue and being like, okay, this is, there's some stuff that's very eye rolling. Having the context now of, you know, where drummer comes from and the, what the planetary book actually represents. It, it's very, uh, very clever of them to be telling the story of Kate through this way. Okay. Well, I didn't get any of that though. Uh, yeah. All I got was Kate talking to someone who's apparently a vampire, uh, who I don't really know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I assume. So I, I assume she was yeah. in a, a Batwoman book at one point. Yes, Batwoman book where she tried to change her to a vampire, and they were. I think they were lovers. It was post. I want to say it was post. Um, Renee, and, and all of that stuff. After okay. they, had, they had gotten back together. So this is New Fifty Two uh, stuff we're talking about then. I would say I think it's, it's set after that because I don't remember. I don't. I don't think I've read too much of it because I looked up. I was like, "Who's this Nocturna character?" So it's somewhere in between the the Batwoman that we read early on in Rebirth, and and the J. H. Williams and uh, Ruckus stuff, you know. So somewhere in that late, right before New Fifty Two, and maybe during, but I'm not quite sure. Um, but I like that we're not running from any of her, uh, any of her story. Right? We're gonna we're gonna address this, and I kind of like. Kind of like what this represents for Kate going forward. I mean, you say that, but why do why would I care about addressing it if I didn't read it? I didn't know this was the thing or existed. So, so we had this whole issue a couple back, right, where Kate has the trauma of a bat, right, uh, where that's going sure. forward. Yeah. Okay, and then we have that Luke doesn't, right. So even though he wants to be this bat and he wants to do the whole Batwing thing. It's almost like the universe is telling him he's he's not ready for this type of stuff. So in this issue, right, they they get an invite from Nocturna, I believe that's the vampire's name, to come into this almost like I don't want to call it a BDSM club, right? Being not familiar with a lot of that stuff, but it I, is. I was very... thinking it was a vampire orgy. That's what it kind of felt like to me. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it's beyond vampires, right? Because we got Clayface and we have. True. Yeah, there's some other. Uh, all of these other and killer crocs in there and it's almost this representation of monsters where they can just they can cut loose and i think they call it consensual predation right and so um the our our outsiders right batwoman batwing and drummer get the invite to come into this but they're told you can't none of that hero stuff right this is all consensual and and you can't stop anything even if you wanted to which luke learns the hard way because we follow his story and he ends up running into this little kid and and he ends up trying to get this little kid out and when he gets the kid out the kid transforms into clarion the witch boy and is like oh luke see you fell right into it this this was never meant for you you know Uh, and when you contrast that to kate where kate's story is She's going through and talking with Nocturna, and Nocturna's basically trying to tell her, hey, you're you're a monster too. That's what the bats are. You can try to run from it, you can try to do anything, but in, in the end, you're one of us, whether you like it or not. And she even introduces, you know, the the fact that she she never wanted kids. It's what led her to become a vampire. So she she ran into the woods, you know, during like I'm assuming Victorian era Gotham. She talks about the Arkham Woods, mm. um, and there's you know the the sire that made her into a vampire was there, and then she she brings up this kid that she has who she calls the End, and who, who's not a vampire but was birthed from her and her sire, and he basically essentially just kind of represents see to me as I was reading it, just kind of the idea of of human monsters. Because he's not a vampire in that way, but he's capable of so much more. I mean, this is Connor, right? This is this is Angel and Darla's <laughs> son, Connor. Look, I thought you meant our Connor. No, no, no. <laughs> Although the like, idea of a character called yes. the End also being yes. Connor is quite yes. funny. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's got a son, but the son's human, and she calls him right. the End, and he's like an omen to, of things to come and all that. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Drummer kills this uh, demon, demon dude. <laughs> Where they talk about, you know, this demon represents, you know, so they can do the predation and stuff. But in order for Drummer to really belong there, Drummer has to, you know, do this act. And uh, so they Drummer swears to the demon 
and then ends up killing the demon, making the pact go through to get what she wants. And seemingly, it's yeah. I'll well, just explain that the monster sa- says yes. you have to swear to me to kill someone in my name. Mm-hmm. And oh, then, that's right. and then drummer, a year and a day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a year to do it, and then she just immediately kills him. The idea being that this is a loophole for the rules that because right. she's doing it for him and it was his suggestion, it's therefore right. consensual, and she kills him. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's that was the thing. Right, because because uh, drummer wants uh, something that's between the pages, right? Uh, there's something that that drummer's trying to access while they're in this club, while Kate is talking to Nocturna and Luke's doing his thing. Um, and again, that's what I mean. This is like a planetary issue where we're seeing these bigger seeds of of what our characters are doing in the story, but also kind of what this represents in in the meta context. And that's like, what is Kate's, what is Kate's role in, in all of this? And, uh, cause she basically tells Nocturna, like, I'm not, you know, you, you've done tried, but I'm bigger than that. I'm, I'm always going to be a bat. Like my mom, my mom was a soldier. Right. And, and I was born the day that she was gunned down in front of me, you know? So I don't have any other choice and you can say like, it's supposed to be this bad thing, but you know, I'm going to make it what I want to. And so it ends up leaving her to, to go hunting, right? Cause they, they compare it to the predation inside of that, you know, tower, wherever they are. Like, cause I got the vibe that's a much bigger place than just a couple rooms. Right. Cause it's like a skyscraper. Yeah. Um, that she's going to go out on her own hunt. Cause that's, that's what she does. Um, yeah, meaning and just go and patrol as a bat character. Patrol as a bat character, and that's how she's doing it. So, like, they can tell her that she's one of them all she wants, but she's going to make her own mind up. And that's kind of where Kate's always been when it comes to Batman in this. So, the fact that it's reinforcing her character, uh, and we're using these kind of meta stories to to show that no, she's just as valid. I wouldn't say as Bruce, right? But she's just as valid as a bat character because of all those other stuff. I'm just curious to what that means for for Batwing, because, you know, the whole point of Clarion goes up. You you couldn't even follow through on the rules, right? You you couldn't help but be be this hero in this place. I'm just wondering what, what they're trying to do with that. But that's what's going to keep me coming back to read this book. Well, I felt like him staring into his reflection at the end and seeing himself in bat armor kind of was yeah. a, a hint of, like... Yeah. Uh, him realizing that he is kind of a bad character, even mm-hmm. if he's not tormented in the same way, because he's got that yeah, drive but... to do things. But I just, I just, I didn't like this issue. Well, I didn't dislike it. I, I think yeah. it's a fine issue, but this issue felt like it was setting up a lot of things that are going to be important later when all mm-hmm. of these plot threads that they're setting up come together. I think yeah. it's less successful in all the previous issues because it didn't feel that enjoyable on its own. I didn't really care yeah. all that much about this Nectar character being a vampire or being in this weird S&M mm-hmm. club. Every other issue that's introduced me to a new set of characters or a new place mm-hmm. has made them interesting in their own right, and it doesn't matter yeah. if, if I don't know anything about it from beforehand. Here, it felt like, okay, I can see this all been interesting stuff once this comes back up. Like, at some point, this kid called the end might be yeah. important in where the overall story is going. Maybe now Tara's going to show up. The stuff that Drummer did may be important later. But this felt very much like an in-between issue to me, where it was doing a lot of setup things, but it wasn't really that satisfying to me uh, on its own. Like, I didn't really feel like I got like a really meaty yeah. issue out of this. Yeah, and I, and I, I can see where that comes from. Uh, I just, I really like the, you know, the contrasting stories here of the three of them in this club, right? Where, you know, Luke can't follow the rules. Drummer does follow the rules, you know, to get what she needs out of all of this. And that kind of leaves... The, the question of, of Kate, like, is she doing the right thing type thing? So I, I liked it for all of that stuff, but I, I can get where you're feeling. Like, it's a lot of, this is like a, not a patchwork, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, kind of like a cornerstone where we, we have to build from it, right? So it, it's a, not a cornerstone, because the cornerstone is what you put in. What do, what am I trying to say? But yeah, it's... I actually don't know what you're trying to say, so I can't help you. <laughs> no, so like it, it's a, it's one of those, it's like a bridge type thing, right? Like, we have to have these threads going forward to where the story's going to go. And that's not nearly as satisfying as just, this is a story that can stand on its own, like the first, what, what issue is this, number five? Like the first four have. Um, so yeah. 
Yeah, that, this felt like there was less of a, a goal or something for them to do or figure mm-hmm. out by the end of the issue, and more just like they were all on their own little trips, uh, yeah. which all said something in, you know distinct about each character. I just don't know if I found each of them that riveting on their own. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, the art's pretty good still. And mm-hmm. I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't hate the issue by any means. I, I think yeah. everything it introduces seems fine enough. But yeah. it just wasn't that satisfying in its own right for me in, in this mm-hmm. issue. But I mean, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, mm-hmm. What are you giving uh, Outsiders issue 5? Um, I'm going to give this a... Do I do 7.5 or do I do 8? You know what? I'll just give it the 8. 8? Yeah. I mean... I'll go 7. Like, it's, it's still good. Like, I, I just... After how much I loved that last issue with the Century yeah. Child, and I loved the one with the water, you know, big monster creature that they... Yep they had to befriend like those things were really spoke to me whereas this one was a bit more kind of like oh no this is your clunky in between issue we're going to set up a bunch of stuff or whatever so yeah all right uh where are we now wesley dodds Mm -hmm. the sandman issue six robert vendetti writing with riley rosmo on the art take it away matt Mm -hmm. yeah so this is the final issue of this and vendetti and rosmo really bring the entire story together even though all kind of all had been revealed at the end of the last issue, where it's Vander Lyle, um, Wesley's dad's like friend and business partner, and that you know he knew that Wesley, being a pacifist, would never ever use his science uh, to cause people harm. So he engineered this entire thing in order to force Wesley's hand, um, and so because he knows what's coming. Um, he had seen the war in World War One. He knows bigger things are, are coming and that we can't he can't just stand by and let Wesley not do this. Uh, and so Wesley and him end up having this big fight where Wesley ends up getting his, you know, ends up taking his mask off to try to, you know, try to reason with him as, hey, you're like family. Why would you you, you know, betray my father like this and all of that? And. Uh, while he is fighting, he ends up getting cut with a, uh, with a, uh, where's the, the word here? Why can't I think of things today? Um, a bayonet that Wesley's father had given Vanderlyle. Um, and, uh, Wesley ends up getting kind of dosed with, uh, his own gas as, as he's going through this. And he starts seeing what Vanderlyle has, like, if if they put these gases into a war, what will happen? And so not only is it, is it his dream gas, but we're kind of getting the vibes of the nightmare stuff as well. Um, and uh, as as Wesley's kind of all loopy, Vanderlyle takes that um, and uh, tells him, you know, I lived in the war. Your father lived it. He would understand me. And he goes to stab... Uh, Wesley and uh, he ends up blocking it um, but it finally gets through and that's where Vandalile stops right because he feels like he's won he's made his point um, and uh, as him and Wesley are, are talking he goes uh, Wesley uh, as he's kind of crowing over him Wesley grabs his book that's full of all of the, the uh, formulas and throws it into a fire which very upsets Vanderlyle. And so he picks up a, a fireplace poker um, and ends up just beating the the mess out of Wesley. And I'm thinking as I'm reading this, well, there's no way this guy can get away with it, right? Because this is kind of a prequel series to Wesley's time with the JSA. Um, and as he's basically going to de- you know deliver a killing blow when he pulls a gun on Wesley... There's a gunshot as Vanderlyle tells him, you know, tell your father I said hi. And Wesley's girlfriend, Diane, comes in. She's the one that fires the gun and kills Vanderlyle as he's standing over Wesley. So even though, you know, Wesley had this whole point of I'm going to try to talk to him. There was no talking him down as a pacifist, right, as someone that didn't actually want to kill him. It's really taken out of his hands. And it's Diane that that gives the killing blow to to where Wesley finally, you know, from his stab wound, from getting beat with the fireplace poker, he ends up collapsing into her arms. 
Uh, and it picks up six months later, and Wesley's, you know, in his house. He's he's surrounded by all these oddities, and um, his his butler has made a full recovery. Um, and uh, Diane brings her nephew in to to meet Wesley, and he introduces him as Sandy. Uh, and so we we get a tease of of you know Sandy okay. the Golden Boy slash Sand and. You know, Wesley talks, you know, with Diane and says, hey, like, I have, I've been having dreams. I've been having new dreams, um, you know, and, you know, uh, what does he say here? He says, I can't be the only one who sees where the world's headed and who wants to do something. Am I alone? And Diane commiserates with them. She's like, yeah, I took a man's life. I, I still don't know how to be. And uh, they end up hugging and saying, you know, at least we're alone together. And uh, the butler comes back and says, you know, Mr. Dodds, you have some visitors. And Wesley goes out and the Justice Society is waiting for him. And it is, you know, it's Jay and Hawkman, our man, Alan Scott, the Spectre, Dr. Fate and the Thunderbolt. Um, and they, you know, like, hey, we want to talk to you. We heard you know where the future's going. We want to form a group. So it teases a justice society, you know, uh, at the okay. end of this. Um, I will say we it's it's almost a self-parody to complain about Rosmo's art. Right. So I'm not gonna do that here because I feel like this pulpy, cartoony, this is where his bread and butter is. The art in this book is so good. Um, when we get to the the stuff uh like the action sequences, uh Oh, I'm just taking he, it back. I thought you were building up to, but he's more suited to this, but you just said it's so good. Like you're actually really praising it. I, I am because he is suited for this and this is good art, especially in this issue. When okay. we get to where he is beating Wesley, right? We get one of his kind of crazy layouts where it kind of goes all over the place, but it's not, it's easy to follow. You're not going around, but on the top of the page, it's Vander Lyle hitting him with the fireplace poker. And then there's a bunch of these smaller panels that are kind of like at Dutch angles throughout the middle of the page. And each one of them is like a different body part on Wesley. Right. So it's like, it's, it's his hand. It's like from his shoulders up, his glasses are bent and broken and interspersing. All those are, are also panels of Vander Lyle and just his rage. Right. So it's like, you see his mouth grit with his gritting teeth and the fire in his eyes. Uh, and it that page ends with we're looking straight up into Vanderlei, like we're Wesley, and he's standing over him and yelling at him and calling him a coward. So it really drives point, like drives home the point of the emotion in the scene while doing something that I've never really seen. Like I, like you do see perspective stuff like this in comics, but not the way that it works out like this. And it kind of there's there's a like. What what's the word like a like like when it's like a movie? Why right? I'm having a hard time today. I think I need some some sleep. But like when something's like cinematic, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of cinematic in a comic book way because I don't think you could get away with a shot like this in a movie in the way that you can in uh, in a comic. So it's really taking advantage of that. Um, and then when we get to see at the end, you know, the Justice uh, Society, they're in. Rosmo's own way, but they're not they're not as grotesque as we've seen before, you know. Um, and so it gives it a very kind of classic feel to to these characters. He really, you know, I said on, online early in the week, it's dripping with pulp, and and he's very well suited for this. So as we were seeing in in the solicits, yeah, we have a Jeff John Justice Society book going on, but it's been such real hit or miss in the way that. It keeps getting delayed and is on. I would be very comfortable with them handing the reins of Justice Society to Venditti and Rosmo and just setting it in this time period. And we get the adventures of them in in the 30s and 40s and maybe even post through World War II. And I think that, you know, uh, that would be a book I would definitely be interested in, in reading month to month. Because uh, Venditti shows real here. He has a, a good take on the characters. And Rosmo with this time period, I mean, we've talked about it with the Batman and Shadow book. He, it's just something about his art that lends itself to this era. So, and I'm I'm surprised because again, it's easy to kind of bag on him, 
uh, with a lot of the stuff that we've seen in his Harley and his Martian Manhunter, uh, that it's just not our taste. This is very much my taste. So it kind of shocked me. But this, as a whole, this story is really good. And I'm glad I, I kept up on it. Um, and yeah, uh, so this issue, I will give an 8.5. Can't say I would be as enthusiastic if they announced the GSA book by this team. I, and I realised that I am being such a grumpy dick this mm-hmm. week because I didn't like most of my books. So I, I yeah. like I'll, Green Lantern, yeah. super positive. Everything else has been middling for me to to just, I, I, I hate this. This is terrible. Yeah. This sucks. Well, and, that, that, and yeah, coming off of an action book too, where I, you know, I wanted to like it. Reading, reading this book and it really comes together with all the threads and then at the end, you know, the Justice Society's there. Um, I, you know, it's it's hard not to be excited, for at least for me. So, yeah. All right. Uh, well, I got a Patreon book to catch up on. I will be talking about Batman and the Outsiders, issue 12. Uh, this is the second half of the, like, secret history of Katana mm-hmm. uh, story that was started last time. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, the whole story last time was that uh, this villain showed up who turned out to be the brother of Katana's husband who stole her sword so they could bring out these five spirits, including the, the dead husband, uh, to be like this, you know, Yakuza boss's team of, like, badasses to do whatever he wants. So that, that was kind of where we left off. And the outsiders, you know, came to Japan. Katana came on her own, but the rest followed her. And said, we're not letting you do this on your own. Uh, which was, you know, a fun bit. It was a fun like, kind of like, oh, okay, they're, they're all in this together kind of thing. Uh, so this is another solid issue. Uh, I really I really like this two-parter. Um, seeing the characters in Japan, uh, the way they play off some of the relationships, um, particularly between Katana and Halo later on in the book, I quite like. Uh, but... The characters, the outsiders, that is, go t- to the, the building where the bad guys sh- should be, and Batman wants to snoop. He wants to be covert. Uh, he's like, hey, no one expects a, like a robber on the 45th floor, so the windows are always unlocked. So he sneaks in a window. But of course, the others cannot wait. Uh, Katana has Halo like hover her up at another window so she can see what's going on, and very quickly, some of the villains realize there's someone there and fighting breaks out to the point where batman like hears this and goes one of these days i'm going to teach them the meaning of the word obedience <laughs> i was all right bad dad getting yeah. very upset with him but he's venturing very co- close to the goddamn batman <laughs> uh but katana sees her dead husband so obviously it's this touching reunion but if you remember the other part of the cliffhanger from last issue is that katana's husband has been tasked to kill her and he doesn't want to mm-hmm. but he like he, he actually like pams her face after she hugs him and she's like what are you doing and he's like, i don't want to my love but i have to kill you please go so i can't kill you and you know he's taking swipes at her and she's dodging and honestly the next couple of pages are mostly like just different panels of various members of the team fighting various members of the villain team uh so we get you know and remember all the villains are all based after uh, different okay. weapons so there's stone axe yep. There's a, mm-hmm. uh, you know, shuriken and so on. Uh, so Batman realizes that they're not prepared for this fight. They've rushed in without preparation. And you know, Batman loves his preparation. He's all about it. He's mm-hmm. like, no, we need to go now. Everyone, let's go. And he has Halo grab Katana with her powers. And uh, she's like, put me back. How dare you? And like Batman's like, no, 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 leave her here. So so they, they bolt, right? They get away. And Batman's like, Katana... You're going to have to explain some of this to us. What the hell's going on? So she tells the story of growing up. She had a normal childhood, but she was good at martial arts. That was like the one thing. And these two men who are brothers both fell in love with her. And she picked her husband, right? Uh, Mazio, uh, as opposed to the bad guy. And, you know, that's, that's who she picked. The other brother didn't even come to the wedding. He instead went and joined the Yakuza. Right? <laughs> so he rose through the ranks of that, whilst Katana had two kids with her husband, and then the bad brother got gifted these two swords, right, from a mob boss, and they're, you know, these magical swords that can do this, do that, and notably, you know, possibly suck in the soul of whoever they kill with them. 
and he comes back to their home dressed as a ninja to enact revenge for his brother taking the woman that he wanted. And this is actually quite dark because a candle gets knocked over and the place goes up in flames. And not only does Katana's husband get stabbed uh, and killed by his brother, but the two kids die, right? You can hear them crying for their mum and dad from beyond the flames. And by this point, uh, the, the husband's like dead in the sword and he's like, no, Tatsu, they're lost. Save yourself. You have to survive. So one of us does. So like her tragic backstory is not just that her dead husband's in the sword, but it's also the fact that she had two children who also died in this incident. So this all- is something that never gets brought up. No, right? no, like, I, I, I didn't always know this. the husband. I don't remember the kids ever. When I turned the page and I saw her in like a hospital bed with two babies, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know about this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So they're all like in shock and they're like, oh, oh, Katara. I'm so sorry. Uh, so it's all very uh, moody and whatnot. Uh, Metamorpho realizes that the two shuriken that he had stuck in him from one of the bad guys, notably mm-hmm. shuriken, the character. Uh, they're glowing when they come together, so they're thinking they can use them to like sort of like follow a trail to the villains. So they do, uh, and it seems that the villains are up to something. Uh, the the mob boss is going to a meeting with this American gangster, who is like ready to make a deal with them to try and like build this international empire. But the American gangsters get a bunch of people waiting, so. Uh, the the team of warrior spirits have been sent in first to basically take out everyone that's a threat, and sure enough, they do. And then the mob boss uh, shows up, and the Americans like, look, we were going to try and play this nice and pretend that we were friends, but basically, join us or die. That's your options. Uh, and just as they're about to start firing or stabbing weapons at each other, uh, that's when the outsiders arrive and. Uh, you know, I think it's like a batarang. No, actually, no, it's a shuriken. It must be the shuriken that they had from uh, before. It uh, was thrown at the, the, the bad guy's hand. Uh, so, yeah, we get another fight scene where, again, a lot of the characters pair off um, and, you know, action ensues. Uh, it's good fun. My favorite part of all this, though, is that basically Katana's husband is, like, constantly saying, like, you have to win this fight. I don't want to hurt you right? Please kill me. Please win this. And she's like, I will not kill you. I will not do it. And Katana's husband makes the bold choice to threaten to kill Halo. Because he's like, okay, you won't kill me to save yourself? Fine. What about her? And he goes after Halo, and that's when Katana throws her her, her Katana at him and, and kills him. And basically, what I liked about this is that they've spent a lot of time in this book up until this point with this sort of like big little sister relationship between Katana and Halo. They've been living together. She's been kind of looking out for her. And I think this was a good payoff to that. It was like, okay, this is someone innocent that he's threatening. And it's this idea that she can't kill her husband because she loves him to save herself, but she will do it to save someone innocent. Um, And he was smart enough to realize that. Uh, She also, and Batman, he doesn't say anything. he's, He's just in shadows in the art to imply that he's pissed about it, but Katana straight up stabs the the other brother, the bad guy. She just takes her Katana and stabs yeah. him, right? And then she puts the Katana on her back, and you just see his face in the blade, right? And there's a little bubble saying, Katana, please free me. And it's like, oh no, he's in the sword now too, right? So it's basically hey. saying, like, he's, he's going to be with her now too as the bad brother who killed her husband, and inadvertently the kids. Uh, right. I mean, maybe he was going to do that anyway, but it seemed like an accident when he attacked right. her in the flashback, but uh, regardless, it's his fault, uh, and that's the whole thing. So, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of action in this issue, but the flashback to Katana's backstory was super dark and really kind of, like, made it all the more tragic. Her having to, like, kill the husband that she's so happy to have alive again because he's been puppeted by bad guys to save another character that we've kind of grown to care about over the run, as she has... Uh, is a really good way of like kind of like connecting the characters to the audience because we both kind of want to save Halo, and I think that's done quite well. Uh, yeah, uh, really solid stuff uh, overall. Uh, this two part has been 
a really strong example of them sort of taking the characters further in this issue or in this in this book. Uh, there's a little epilogue page at the end where Batman gets sick and kills over on the bat plane on the way back home, and they're basically saying, "Oh, you got you got like tagged with one of the shuriken, and it was probably laced with poison." And they're concerned that this this you know this character, the shuriken character, is from a long time ago, so the poisons might not be like obvious things. It might even be something that has no antidote. So it ends on a cliffhanger uh, hmm. that Batman might be dying. Obviously, he won't because you know. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's like ten Batman books not, out every month. Not, so. I said not this time. Yeah. Well, maybe next time. Uh, but they do point out that the next issue is an anniversary issue, so it's yeah, issue thirteen. Yeah. It'll have been a year right. since the book started. So. Right. Uh, fun that they're celebrating that. Maybe it's a fun idea to have the characters have to like work together as a team on their own without Daddy Batman kind of mm-hmm. calling it orders and directing them and what to do. Uh, maybe he to prove a point he ate some poison to see if they were <laughs> going to be obedient you know maybe maybe that was the idea yeah. uh, you know the book I mean it was a solid issue I really liked the two parter uh, the apparel art is is really solid particularly when it's doing like there's you know whenever when anyone's angry or upset it does a really good job of showing that in the faces the only critique I would maybe have is that the brother character uh, who was, you know, the ninja before. Yeah. Um, he's in, like, a business suit towards the end of the book, and I actually didn't get immediately that that was him that got stabbed by Katana, mm. because he kind of just looks like a white guy in that panel, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and I, it kind of threw me off a little bit, because I was wondering who this was supposed to be and why she went out of her way yeah. to kill him. Um, but I went back and checked it to previous pages and went, oh, no, that must be him. That must be the brother. It makes, it makes the most sense story-wise that it's him. Yeah, uh, but so that's like a minor kind of nitpick there because it was uh, made that moment a little unclear at first. I had to kind of like corroborate it with other pages, but uh, no, it's definitely one that has less comedy in it, less humor because it's more of a serious thing. You know, like mm-hmm. Katana's obviously cares about this deeply. She wants to get to the bottom of it. They have to basically drag her away, kicking, screaming from the first fight to try and regroup. Uh, maybe from like a larger comics like like argument, I could say. Well, Batman pulls them out of the first fight because they're unprepared, and then they immediately go back to fight them after they've had this conversation with Katana. Did they really have any other understanding of who these all these villains were to fight them the second time when they won? Not really. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, but no, it's a solid issue. Uh, I think the next issue is the last issue in the first uh, collection. Uh, okay. These big collections uh, that they've put out of them, which is in three volumes, or is it an omnibus? I think it's an omnibus. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there you go, issue 12. Uh, yeah, solid 8. 8.5. 8. 8.5 out of yeah. 10. So. Yeah, the, the kids thing, That's I thought I knew Katana's origin, but that's something that gets forgotten, or they personally they ought to have her not be so traumatic. Yeah, maybe they, they tried the retcon because they thought it was a bit too dark. <laughs> yeah, dead husband's enough, you know? Yeah. Uh, All right, like Joe Chill also killing Bruce's family dog. <laughs> that was along with them, <laughs> you know. Like, shoot, Bruce actually had two younger siblings that got shot yeah. in the head as well. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, oh, Joe Chill just Joe... ran out of bullets. He's like, oh well, I guess that thank, one stays. Thank God the DCEU's out because I don't need no more ideas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that'll take us out of the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff for the week: favorite panel slash moment, favorite cover, favorite art. And top five books, and oh, th- this is a rough week uh, for me. For you, yeah. I but it's I also, like the majority of things I read. But it's also a rough week, just in general, week two right now. Like, because e- even if uh, I liked Outsiders as much as normal, that would still yeah. just be two books that I really like, as yeah. opposed to you know other weeks where I've got like a whole handful of them. But yeah. Anyway, uh, what's your panel slash moment of the week? All right, am I a mark if I make it the Green Lantern Oath? Because that one's really, really good. I mean, it um, does, but that's okay. Yeah, I mean, in, in other books, I really did like in action. The one thing I did like was that last panel of Superman seeing Bizarro and it, it's being an imperfect reflection. Um, and then, of course, there's there was a couple from Sandman. I mean, the introduction of Sandy was pretty fun. That last page with the Justice Society. Um, but this was all just a roundabout way to say it's the Green Lantern Oath part. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm sure Adams was giddy getting to write that. You know, yeah. Uh, 
for me, yeah, I've, yeah, it probably has to be from Green Lantern, I think, for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, part of me wants to go with a Jess moment, but I think the art just takes it down a notch that I, I don't think I can. So I'm going to go with uh, just to reveal the power battery in general, because yeah. it was kind of an interesting direction to take yeah. this in. So I'll mm-hmm. go with that, but... Uh, yeah, a cover of the week. Um, I only have two I really want to mention. I want okay. to mention there's a great Doc Shainer variant for Green Lantern with Jessica. Mm-hmm. Uh, looks looks really really nice. Mm-hmm. But my pick is the main cover, which is the Adam Beach. Uh, not not Adam Beach. Sorry. Uh, is it? Is it? Let me let me see. Hold on. Steve Beach. Okay. Steve I, Beach. I knew, I knew yeah, it sounded I, wrong. Adam Beach is an actor. Yeah. But I knew it sounded yeah. wrong. I'm like yes. But yeah, Beach. Uh, yeah, Steve yes. Beach. It's, it's, it's Hal like burning through the atmosphere coming out of Earth. Mm-hmm. But it just, you know, it's, it's that glorious painted style. I really like it. Yes. Uh, what's yes. your pick, Matt? All right. So I have uh, I, I have two other ones to mention. Uh, the uh, Sandman has a Sebastian Fumiara cardstock variant mm. that's got Wesley. Uh, it looks, it's one of those painted style covers on a green background. And his the, the smoke from a smoke gun is making like a skull. So just I mean, uh, if that's not a cover on a on a collection, I think they're messing up. Uh, and then Outsiders has a uh, Skylar Patridge the cover that I mean looks like uh, it looks like a movie poster. Uh, it is fantastic. It's got Nocturna in the background as just like this disembodied face with Gotham and Kate in the foreground. It it looks like I'm I'm shocked this wasn't the main cover for this issue. Um, but my choice is going to be one you already mentioned and it's the Doc Shainer. Sure. Uh, yeah, the Doc Shainer Jess cover. It's fantastic. I'm very sad my shop didn't get this one. Or if it was, it was gone by the time I got there. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Best R of the week. Uh, it, do you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, man. So I really wanted to give it to Rosmo, right? Um, uh... <laughs> But like it's Zermanico, and he got to draw. Yeah, it's Zermanico. Yeah, he got to draw him doing the oath. He got Hal in space finally. Like, uh, it's just it's really really good. And I didn't dislike the art in the backup as much as you did. Um, so yeah, Green Lantern got a got a clean sweep for me this week. Yeah, I'll give it to Green Lantern as well. Obviously for the main story more more yeah. so. But uh, yeah, uh, that's my pick. Um, all right, uh, top five books, which I think for you is all five. Or all, no, you've only got four because you didn't read Batman and Robin. Four. Yeah, rank, yep. rank your books, Matt. All right, so one is going to be Green Lantern. Two is going to be uh, The Sandman. Three is going to be Outsiders. And four, like, there's a big chasm between those. <laughs> uh, and then four is Action Comics. Yeah, my number one is Green Lantern. My number two is Outsiders, even though I was, I was a bit more lukewarm mm-hmm. on it this time. Uh, number three is... Batman and Robin, number four is Action Comics. Yeah. 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 Apologies. If I came over a grumpy audience this week, like if I was like a, just a, a negative Nancy this episode, it just, you know, sometimes you, you've got a week of books where you don't like most of them, and it's, uh, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it makes for a less pleasant time. Hopefully I'll be in good spirits, because coming up next week from DC Comics, we have Nightwing 112. We got Batman Superman World's Finest 25. We got Superman issue 12. We got Titans issue nine. We got Wonder Woman issue seven. Justice Society of America issue nine. Uh, Catwoman sixty three. Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong issue six. Green Lantern War Journal issue seven. John Constantine Hellblazer Dead in America issue three. Batman eighty nine Echoes two. And finally, DC's April special issue one. So yeah. So. I am fully going to read the April special. Maybe not next week, considering it's the 400th. I might earmark that for the next week to okay. celebrate the release of Godzilla X Kong. Sure. Um, yeah, but next week, that week's not that packed. So, yeah. No, no. Uh, but, I mean, it's, it's a book about gorillas. I have a brand. I feel like I, I have to do it. So, um, but yeah, stacked week next week. Oh yeah, the week after super quiet. Yeah, yeah. You can you yeah. can talk about the gorilla book <laughs> yeah. that week. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So we got you've got you know there's not I many. It's not a super busy. Week. It just feels busy compared to these other ones. But yeah, mm-hmm. we got about eight or nine books next week. 
and uh, it's episode 400, so we'll be doing mm -hmm. something as well for, for that. Uh, so hopefully you guys enjoy uh, the episode. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode, because we're wrapping up. This has been episode mm -hmm. 399. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. We'll see you for, for more DC shenanigans. Uh, you can support the show by going over to patreon.com slash TV and supporting us over there and help keep the lights on. But you can also support us for free by liking uh, on YouTube, rating us on iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast from, sharing us maybe on Twitter, at DC Comics Podcast on Twitter, for the record. Uh, but that is us, so thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics, and remember, to never get lost in the Speed Force. Can't believe Pete's done 399 of these. <laughs>